use headphones or not? Oh, yeah, I do, actually. Do you, you like to use them? I still haven't decided. Oh, you know what? Let's not, because it's. I didn't know it was going to be filmed. It looks better with, if it's filmed without them. We'll without just go without them? them. Yeah. I sometimes do it because it makes me feel like I'm more focused or something. Oh, really? Well, see, if I'm recording an audiobook or something, I wear them because they help me hear myself. Yeah. Uh, so when I'm recording, I use them. Yeah. Sometimes, well, we'll just play it by ear. Yeah. We'll try them and take them off. For me, it's like a Pavlovian thing. It's like now it's time to focus. Okay. If this thing is squeezing your head, you need to pay attention. All right. <laughs> um, can you tell how uh, intimidated by I am by the fact that you're here based on all the makeup I have around me? Really? I've been putting makeup on for the past like 20 minutes in really? anticipation of you arriving. Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> they all think I'm insane. I was acting like a 15-year-old girl waiting for a boy to show up. I was pacing around my house and looking out the window waiting for you to show up. Really? Yes. Gee, that's nice. I'm I, a very big fan. Oh, that's so nice of you to say. I didn't... Uh, gosh, I never expect that. Really? Yeah. That's wild. I mean, I expect it like... I didn't expect to be on the New York Times bestseller list, you know, but I, I don't expect that, you know, when I go somewhere to anybody to know who I am. Really? Well, who do you think's buying all those books that put you on the bestseller list? <laughs> well, like, I do shows in L.A. sometimes. Yeah. And it's funny because I met uh, Matthew Weiner, you know, who... Oh, uh, love Mad Men, yeah. Yeah. And... He and he said, "Oh, I've come to see you a bunch of times." And he said, "It's always TV writers in the audience." And I never knew yep. that. Oh yes, never occurred to me. Huge. You're all of our hero, basically. Huh. <laughs> never ever occurred to me because I meet, you know, I sign books and I ask people, and I never meet them. Mm. I mean, I never meet anybody who. Or you never ask TV. them what their occupation is. No, know? I do all the time, but I I've never met anybody who said, "Oh, I write for this or that show." So I guess. They don't stand in line. You know? oh, that's so, oh, that's interesting. They probably get the backstage passes. What's the weirdest thing anyone's ever asked you to sign? Mm, I, don't, I, I don't like to do that. You know, like somebody, oh, a guy came up and I did notice, right? I mean, you couldn't help but notice that one of his arms ended just below the elbow. Mm -hmm. And it kind of looked like a chicken wing a uh -huh. little bit, you know? Well, no. It kind of petered out. It wasn't like... And then he said, will you sign my stump? And then I had to act like, you have a stump? You know, <laughs> which, of course, I'd already seen it. The performance begins. Yeah. And so I said, okay, sure. Whereas if somebody said, would you sign my arm? I wouldn't do it. Just because I'm not a celebrity. So I, f so I don't sign things. And I feel like signing books I'm comfortable right and then a lot of people now you know they listen to audiobooks on their phone so will you sign my phone it's like okay mm -hmm. will you sign my kindle yep 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 but what a lot of people do now and I don't I don't know if it's a where they got this idea but they'll come and say you signed this book three times already will you sign it again and you want it and a couple of times I've said I've said uh, you're the 20th person tonight to ask me to do that and then they look like you slapped them because they think that it's original Ugh. and it's far from original. Yeah. And it's not a money thing. I just don't want to do it. I don't think it's funny. And so now I yeah. say, I'll sign a piece of paper and you can do whatever you want with it. Mm. You know. Do you ever feel like people need a lot from you? Uh, like yeah, when but they come you know up what? Like that? I don't have that much to do, so I'm happy to give it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't ever feel... There's this author who I met, and she uh, in the Netherlands, and she said, "Oh, I I can't sign books for more than ten minutes because people tell me stories, and I'm just drained, and then I can't do anything for the next three days." And I'm like, "That's not a problem for me. I mean, <laughs> people tell me horrible things, and I sleep like a baby. Like it doesn't <laughs> bother me in the least bit, and I never think of it, of it in a vampiric way." Yeah. Uh, it's everything I ever dreamed of, is that people would stand in line to talk to me. And whatever they want to talk about is fine, and I'm happy to sit there. My record is ten and a half hours. Wow. And, and if there had wow. been another 400 people in line, I would have said, okay. Wow. Because it's all I ever wanted. And I really, to tell you the truth, I don't see a downside to it. I do when people aren't paying attention. Mm-hmm. 
and you're completely nice to somebody and you're engaging and then they complain about what you wrote in the book. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's and it's yep. like I was nice. Yep. I, 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 I did this thing where I was drawing. I, I was, it sounds so bad. I was drawing people naked, right? <laughs> I said, oh, this is your portrait naked. And I drew this woman's portrait naked and her daughter came to me and said, my mother had breast cancer. And you drew her with those drooping breasts that you drew. And and her mother was already like 80. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I was drawing her mother so at a cancer hundred. Thing. It's a gravity thing. Yeah. yeah. And it didn't have anything to do with the... And, and I was talking to the mother, and I was drawing a picture in her book, and I was – so I, I just I just felt like if the mother came and if I just signed my name and pushed the thing back to her, and then you want to complain, great. You have every right to. But I, I thought we were having a moment, you know. That's so interesting. It, I think also I try to think of the kind of people that will come up and talk to you or, or, or you know, I think mine's probably a little bit different, but these are probably very sensitive people. You know, these I, I try to just always stay in that mode. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, the kind of people that are sitting here waiting are probably a sensitive, emotional group of people that need a lot from me, and I just have to forgive whatever their behavior is. Well, I remember, like, I went and saw somebody when I lived in Chicago, and it, she was a, a comedian slash actress more than a writer, but she put a book out. Mm-hmm. And I went to get her book, and it was a lot of money for me at the time. Mm. And I got up there, and she was talking to her. I guess maybe it was her publicist. And she said, yeah, I don't know. There's really not that much to do in this town. She just saw my book and pushed it back to me. And I, and I felt so betrayed Ooh. by that. And. I just thought when it's my turn mm-hmm. and I'm the author, I'm never, ever going to do that, ever. That's so cool. But then, like you know, like I said, like my agent called one day and said, I got a letter from this woman and she's crazy. And she said she came with her 15-year-old daughter and you gave the daughter a condom. You said, <laughs> and you told the daughter you didn't want to be responsible for her getting pregnant. And so she could only use this for anal sex. Okay. And I said, yeah, I remember her. I remember it exactly. But I said it in a nice way. You know? It's very helpful. I mean, I wish, I wish you were around when I was 16. It would have saved me a lot of uh, Planned Parenthood visits. But the, the, the line had been cut off, mm-hmm. right? Because I, had, I do it before and after the show. So the line had been cut off, and mm-hmm. it was time for me to go start the show. And this woman said, you can do one more. You know, like, there's always that person. You can do one more. And, yeah. and it was, I noticed it was a young girl. You know, 15, she was 15. And then I thought, okay, I can do... Yeah, you're right. I can do one more. And then I engaged the girl and I talked to her. And then the mother got so upset. And it's like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I went out of my way. And I was, you know, I was friendly and everything. Yeah. And I don't expect the daughter yeah. to have anal sex with... I mean, <laughs> I that's such a crazy thing to say. It doesn't... <laughs> Like, there's a ridiculous clause, like... Yes, yes. Uh, there was something I wrote for the New Yorker one time, and then I said, can we get in trouble, and can we get... And they said, no, that's what you proposed is so ridiculous <laughs> that nobody would be allowed to take it seriously. Right. And that, to me, is what that is. Yeah. And if she was wearing a bonnet, you know, and she was wearing clothes she had made herself mm-hmm. on the loom that her family has, and she rode to the came to the reading in a buggy, I would not... I would not have said that. <laughs> she seemed, you know, she lived in a big city. I figured she'd heard of anal sex. <laughs> Parents are in such denial about the internet. It's just so funny. Mm. It's like, oh, you think this is bad? Wait till your kid watches a movie or sees the internet. <laughs> and you're really going to be stressed out. Well, but it's different for you because you. Like when you're meeting people, is it more like a stage door situation? When I'm meeting people, I think I, I think I put myself in a situation. I have so much gratitude for what I do. I'm like you. I never in a million years thought anyone would wait in line to want to talk to me or sign something. And I stay as long as I can always. But I do think with me, people often try to be funny and they end up hurting my feelings. Mm. It's pretty common. Hey, cunt. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like it's, you know, I think if you do a certain type of comedy or I did the roasts a lot, you know, people really want to come up and, you know, insult me or make right. me laugh. And it just ends up <laughs> making me uh, 
hurting, breaking my heart sometimes. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm um, so intimidated about doing this because I just watched your master class and I loved the section on how to ask good questions. So I feel like I need oh. to open on, do you know a lot of doctors? <laughs> I don't know enough. I mean, the doctors that I'm getting to know lately are like working on me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I but I don't have friends who are doctors, but that's exactly the kind of friends yeah, that you need. Yeah. But I met a doctor at a party. Mm-hmm. And pardon me. Um I met a doctor at a party in England, and I hope that might lead to something. But I haven't seen him since then. But I'd love to. Uh, I've been meeting a lot of doctors at readings because I a doctor came and told me about somebody who'd shoved a, a dildo up his ass, and the door shut behind it. <laughs> and then, and then that happens. Apparently, you stick something three quarters of the way up, and the asshole says, "I'll take that," and yep. it just sucks it right yep, in there. Yep, yep. And think direction. And so, why wasn't this in your master class? I would have loved <laughs> to see that portion. Well, then the guy tried to get it out with a coat hanger. Oh no, no, no! Yeah, no. and then that didn't work. So he cut the coat hanger with with metal clippers mm. and went with another coat hanger. Okay, and where was this? Florida. I I have it written down in my diary, the state. But and I said, what did the guy say? He's and the guy said, oh, I tripped. Oh. So he came in. <laughs> Like to make it sound like he was like maybe bringing the dildo to his wife and he had hangers, you know, she, and then he fell down the stairs. And then the next thing, you know, <laughs> but another big excuse, people say, oh, I accidentally sat on it like a thermos <laughs> that was coated with Vaseline. Yeah, I was going to say this took a lot of lubing yeah. up, a lot yeah. of orchestrating, a lot of practice. And so do- and so I've met a couple nurses who send me pictures now. <laughs> That's a good end. Chilling pictures. Bone chilling. Like one picture, and it was somebody, maybe they were uh, they were diabetic, and they had a hole in the top of their foot, but you could see the tendons in their foot. <gasps> but what was interesting about it, and, and she said these people always say, oh, it just happened two days ago. <laughs> and like, there's no way it just happened two days ago. But they let it go, which right. is exactly what I would do. When people lie to them, they have to just yes and and improvise with them. But I would let something like that go. Like, if I noticed a big growth on my shoulder, I'd say it'll go away tomorrow. And luckily, I don't know where I heard this, but people who are married or in a relationship live longer. Mm -hmm. And it's because their partner nags them into going to the doctor. doctor. So interesting. Yeah. Um, I uh, I love the story about the tumor you gave to a snapping turtle. I did a lot of research on why you're not allowed to keep your own tumor. Why? It's apparently state by state, but normally... If there's a some kind of in, disease in it, that, that's their main concern, is that some sort of uh, disease you could contract. And also because they want to do research on it. Um, but there is a website called storeyourtumor.com. <laughs> I got really into this. <laughs> I really screwed up my algorithm <laughs> researching this. And there is a law where you cannot keep a Native American uh, body part. But you are technically allowed to keep your own body parts. So I really want to get into what happened with that tumor. You can't keep <laughs> no. a Native American body part. look this up, it's a law. Body part. No. Be something about the Native American graves and such. Uh, there was a law passed. But you should be able to keep your own. So the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Can you imagine if I mispronounce that in front of him? Uh, makes it illegal to own or trade Native American remains. Otherwise, a few states restrict owning or selling human body parts. I think it was Georgia, huh. Mississippi. I got very into this. I want to get your tumor back from that snapping turtle. <laughs> so, yeah, I got very, very into this. Um, but, you know, a lot of doctors now, dentists, they won't give you your tooth. Oh, that's interesting. And when we were young, you know, they'd always give it to you. We had a now, jar full of teeth. Yeah. yeah. But now they say it could, you could get flesh-eating bacteria from your own tooth, which I think that's overreacting. I think they could put it in some bleach and you'd be fine. So there is now no U.S. federal law preventing the ownership of body parts unless they're Native American. I got very into this. Wait. The general rule is you have custody of it. You are considered the owner of your body parts as long as they're inside of you. <laughs> Once it's outside, we have some reasonable expectation about what's going to be done with it. Uh, so they're only yours as long as they're on the inside. I'm so curious. Did the snapping turtle take it right away? Uh, yeah. I mean, it was just food. Yeah. 
and there's nothing you know a snapping turtle won't like snapping turtles are like foxes like yeah. a fox is never going to say okay. uh, i'm sorry that's too far gone for me <laughs> there's no such thing right it's too far gone for a fox right i um i got very into this uh because in your master class, you talk about the art of asking questions, which for any artist is just the most important thing. And uh, I'm pretty weird at parties because I tend to go straight for like, what meds are you on? Like, I always skip small talk and oh, people huh? really don't like it. But I'm like, I'm here to get jokes. <laughs> I'm not here to socialize. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much the only way I can attune to people. Um, but I got super fascinated by this because whenever someone tells me like, oh, that party was boring or I didn't have any fun or I don't like that person, I always think you just didn't ask the right questions. Right. I do too. You know? Um, and uh, and one of my favorite questions to ask people, and I'm just curious if this is too far, is like asking someone like, like what, do you take any prescriptions? Like I always ask that to people. If I was at a party and somebody came up and said, do you take any prescriptions? I would be so, I would be so happy. And <laughs> I mean, I think, gosh, that's a good question. Yeah. What a good icebreaker. And if I were taking something, let's say, that I was embarrassed about, I would just lie. And I would leave it off the list. Or I'll just open with it. I'll normally go like, oh, the Prozac hasn't kicked in yet. And then they feel to be like, oh, yeah, neither is mine. And I just switched to Wellbutrin or whatever. And you can sort of really start to dig in. But I was saying to someone a while ago, uh, I live mainly in the south of England. And, and, and England's different than most countries. Like there, people are, are warm in the north mm. and kind of colder in the south. Hmm. And we're, and especially growing up in North Carolina where you have to say hello to everybody and you have to um, engage in a lot of, you know, chit chat. Uh, if I'm walking and I'm in the country and I see somebody in the front yard and I say hello, they'll turn their back on me. Wow. They will not even say hello to me. And so. And, and there's a fitness center I've been going to for nine years in this village. I don't know anybody there. I've been going for nine years. No one's ever asked me my name. The people who work at the front desk have never said anything to me. Hmm. Um, like, oh, Christmas is coming. I mean, nothing. Wow. And then there was this guy, and he was like in his 80s. And I said, are you a doctor? And he said, no, what makes you think that? I said, you look just like a doctor. I, I've seen you for years. I always assumed you were a doctor. And he said, no, I used to do this, and then I did this before. So is the interview over? <laughs> and then this friend of mine who's a Whoa! fireman said, I should have said, no, I just, I just have one more question. <laughs> Why are you such a cunt? <laughs> I also love, can you explain to me, In I've seen a lot of English comedians come over, and when they say they don't realize the cunt over here you kind right. of can't say, but bitch in England is like the cunt of England, right? Actually, cunt in England is fanny. And when Americans say, oh, I have it in my fanny pack, they can't believe what they just heard. So fanny is the English version of cunt here? A fanny is a pussy, okay. basically. Because a, a fanny is a tush here. Right. Right? Yeah. But there it's like saying pussy. Ooh, okay, so if you But call cunt it, is not even like... That's you, nothing. That's a term it just of mean, And the French use it that way, too. Right. It just means an idiot. Right. And so it makes me always make, it makes me laugh every time I hear it. <laughs> and here, it's, it, you know, it, it plays differently. Here is the, I, probably the roughest thing you can say to someone. A we, woman, at least. Right, but you wouldn't call a man a cunt here. And that's what's funny in yeah. England is because I hear more men being called cunts, cunts than women. Yeah, it's like, hey, buddy, over there. Or, oh, why are you being such a cunt? Like, why are you being such a... And it's almost like, it's not why are you being such an asshole. It's like, why are you being such an idiot? And know? then fanny would be, why are you being such a fanny? That's like, you're not... No, you would more say like, uh, you know, I met this girl and she stuck an entire 30-watt light bulb up her fanny. <laughs> it would be more like that. <laughs> Took it out with a coat hanger. <laughs> and then bitch over there. Like, what's the roughest thing you can say to a woman over there? Gosh... If you want to verbally abuse a woman in England, how would you do it? Huh. Just in case. Uh, well, I mean, they have so many words like that we don't, mm -hmm. like different words for a slut. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that we don't have, like call somebody a slag or call somebody a... Huh. Gosh, that's a really good question. I mean... Um, and pretty over there is fit, right? He's oh. very fit. Fit? That's like handsome. Oh, gosh. I don't know that I've ever noticed that. I think. Maybe. Um, uh, 
golly, I mean, I know I tried to say cunt on the BBC. How did that and there go? was a time when you could, but now you can't. And I used the word on stage, the perfect, it was a diary entry. Mm-hmm. And this woman went on a date with a man she met online. Mm-hmm. And he, he'd never been married, and he was like in his 50s. And he said, I guess you could say I have a fear of the C word. And she leaned across the table and said, cunt? And he meant commitment, is what he meant. <laughs> and, and then I read that in London, and a woman came and slapped a piece of paper on the counter and said, here's where you can send an apology letter for using that word. But I thought it was a perfect way of using it because you're quoting a woman oh, no, that's who said it She's wrong. by accident. She's wrong. And if, if there's no purer way, I think, to She's wrong. use that word. And look, I mean, it's it's such a wild time. I mean, I I remember you were talking somewhere about how at some comedy festival there was a was it a female comedian who was told not to self deprecate, yeah, or to not to criticize her own body, yeah. Uh, that that really grinds my gears. You know, it's you're you can you're allowed to be offended by something. You're allowed to have feelings about something. That doesn't mean the artist needs to change their behavior. I mean, it's it's to me kind of a scary time that people think that their feedback matters. Well, <laughs> it's funny because I just wrote something about that. And yeah, so this woman, it was a women's comedy festival and she wasn't allowed to make fun of her own body. And that same night that I read that, I listened to some old Toady Fields records mm. And when Toadie Fields was a staple on TV when mm-hmm. I was growing up, and it was like, hey, Toadie Fields on TV! We would all run to watch Toadie Fields. And her whole thing was about how fat and how ugly she was, her whole act, right? And I listened to her Best Of album, and she says, just once, I'd like to open the newspaper and see a headline, Toadie Fields, raped in an alley. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine saying that today? You just said it. It went over great. <laughs> I mean, but, I, but a lot of people don't understand that the that is how the audience feels like you, you know, are self-aware. You have to be able to address things that the audience are thinking. It's a mm-hmm. way to get power over them. I think people don't understand. You're disempowering yourself. No, you're not. This is how I'm gaining my power. Trust us. That drives me totally insane. Um, and I was thinking more about... Uh, questions i've been thinking about this ever since i watched um your episode and one of my favorite questions to ask a woman is what color lipstick is that Hmm. because it will turn into like a 25 minute spiral Mm -hmm. and you learn so much it's like and i had to mix these two colors and this one's discontinued and this one is my mom's and i borrowed this from my you know this is my ex-boyfriend's girlfriend's lipstick i found under his bed i mean it just turns into such a fascinating sort of litany of stories so that's a, a question. I find in New York City, you could always ask what color nail polish Ooh. a cashier is wearing. Because often the cashiers in New York City, like it's like, what's the one thing I can do to make me unfit for this job? <laughs> and it's like, oh, I'm going to grow my nails so long, they're going to curl under. My and only then job I'm, is to push these yeah, buttons. <laughs> so I can basically do nothing. And so they can tend to be pretty... <laughs> rude you know yeah but but if you yeah. say anything about their nails everything changes everything did you do that yourself mm. what color how often do you get your nails done everything changes so much pride yeah it. and it's it takes so much work and i think you know nails are something i never took seriously and it's actually made me a better writer when i put effort into my nails because you're looking at your hands all day that's all we ever look at now so when oh, right. yeah, so uh-huh. when my nails are a mess, I always just my self esteem is a little bit lower. I had a really good idea for fingernails a while ago, and I'm trying to <laughs> remember. It was something to, and I, something I'd never seen anybody do with their fingernails. Uh-oh. Gosh darn it! And I can't remember. Rip them off? No, it was. He's it pulling was, out his notepad. This is a big. It moment. was pretty my good. My heart just skipped a beat. <laughs> this is the infamous notepad. But, just came out. I'm dying. You know how much we could get for that on eBay? But I did have an idea for, and I don't know if this exists yet, okay, a makeup company called Apocalypse, but L-I-P-S. You know, so it would be, and then you could do... Call I, Shark Tank right now. Call Shark Tank, guys. And then you could Just do eye makeup. Dollars. And the eye makeup would be called Apocalypse Brow. Yeah. <laughs> Get the money. I mean, we're printing money in here. Matilda, go call Mark Cuban at Shark Tank. Let's go. Is Shark Tank a show where people put 
bright ideas and to yes, they pitch ideas and then a bunch of financiers give them money huh. to start their product. Well, this I don't know if this exists either, but I thought of a restaurant called Ramen Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I had a pretty. Uh, ambitious. Uh, I, I wanted to do a weave store for a long time. And I worked on a lot of like weave store ideas like Adam and weave, weave oh. it to beaver. I wanted to kind of like <laughs> <laughs> weave it to beaver yes, would be perfect for like pubic hair in there. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable is always a good <laughs> <laughs> Weave Saint Laurent. Take it or weave it. <laughs> <laughs> Take it or weave it is really good. <laughs> Weaving on a jet plane, it could be in the airport. <laughs> Take it or weave it is the best. <laughs> Look, most guys have tried different ways to last longer, but saying the Pledge of Allegiance in your head or counting backwards from 10 doesn't always work. I, maybe saying the Pledge of Allegiance might give you a boner, actually. Maybe we should have said... <laughs> Some people, yeah, for sure. <laughs> America! Oh. Fuck Yeah! <laughs> Folks at Roman, a men's health company, are changing the game with Roman Swipes, the secret to longer-lasting sexuals. Roman Swipes are (laughs) clinically proven to help you last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, fast-acting, but they don't require a prescription. They will not transfer to your partner, so you can last longer without worrying. You got enough worries when you're in there bumping uglies. They're super easy to use, too. Mm-hmm. You just take your swipe out of the packet, you swipe it on your little PP, oh. you let it dry, and then you're good to go. That's all you got to do, and then you got a numb one. <laughs> oh, get 10% off your first order of swipes and free two-day shipping at GetRoman.com slash Whitney. That's GetRoman.com slash Whitney for $10 off and free two-day shipping. GetRoman.com slash Whitney. Ernest, do you have student loans? Refinancing them with Ernest could save you money on lower... Why are you being so sad about this? Because have you ever had a student loan? Yes, I have. (laughs) They suck. Pep it up. I know. People with student loans need a more positive attitude (laughs) to get through it. Ernest, do you have student loans? (laughs) Refinancing them with Ernest could save you money or lower your monthly payment. It only takes two minutes to check your online rate. If you are still paying the same rate you were paying when you graduated, odds are you can reduce your monthly payment and save big, big, big. (laughs) Even if you have refinanced before with today's low rate environment, most people can save by refinancing again. If you qualify, Ernest offers customizable loan terms and no fees. It's fast. It's easy. You just complete a few questions online. Takes like two minutes, which you'll be able to do because you have a college education, which is why you have loans in the first (laughs) place. You're going to get a personalized estimate all without affecting your credit score. Hashtag. That's very important. Uh, You can even combine private and federal loans. Sounds very complicated, but they'll do it. Um, (laughs) Plus, the Internet loves Ernest's customer service. They're rated 9.4 out of 10 on Trustpilot, so you'll always get the support you need. They're the best. Start saving right now. Our listeners get $100 cash bonus when you refinance a student loan at Ernest.com slash Whitney. That's $100 cash bonus when you refinance a student loan at Ernest.com slash Whitney. Uh, Go to Ernest.com. Well, you know, I've said it four times, but go to Ernest.com slash Whitney today. Terms and conditions apply. It's my dream to open a company to just like name stores and name restaurants and stuff. That's Have you ever job. been to the Philippines? I haven't. The Philippines is really the world capital of pun names for businesses. I love it. I didn't expect it at all. I, I went to the Philippines and I laughed all day over yeah. the names of stores. And the Simpsons <laughs> has always been good at that Great too. At that. When they go to a mall... Always the best. I love shops. if you can get three puns in one USA. The USA Network does a good job with this. They have these shows that'll be called like you know blue collar, and it's about blue collar people. You know, they there's a chef that specializes in like f- making fish collar or something, and then it'll be in a blue state, and the guy's name will be like Mister Blue. Like, they'll put so many puns within one thing. So I love coming up with fake USA TV show titles. Um, There was something – oh, it was in my diary. Oh, gosh. What was it? And it was – oh, gosh. All right. Just give me a second. It was – oh, (laughs) I bought my sister Amy some rabbit-shaped candles for her Christmas stocking when I was in Berlin. And then I said to Hugh – I said they're pretty and everything, but when you light them, they smell like burning hair, right? (laughs) 
And every time I've read that on stage, the audience groans. And I don't think that's an acceptable reaction to a pun. Why do people groan? I never groan. Is that new? Is it? Do you notice it's... No, they've always done it. They've always... People are, are conditioned to think that that is the acceptable um, hmm. response to a pun. But... I oh, love you it don't when, think it was visualizing a dead rabbit? No, 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 no. That. They're just groaning because it's a pun, right? You know, it's like it's like ah, you got yeah. me. Or, or more like uh, that. But I don't know why is that the rem- response to wordplay? I remember uh, uh, a friend of mine was working at some company, and they were I don't know they were doing something with puns, and this one guy. Uh, it always, it still makes me laugh, and I hate myself that it makes me laugh. Uh, someone made like a pun about the Holocaust or something, and he goes, uh, I don't want to hear any more puns about the Holocaust, and frankly, I believe we should not ever <laughs> joke about that. <laughs> and it's just, I think maybe it's, <laughs> I, I think maybe it's just because, you know, we work so hard to make things sophisticated and complicated. Sometimes the simplest little things just tickle our brains. I was in Australia a few weeks ago and, you know, the fires are going on. It's all yeah. anyone's talking about. Yeah. And I did a radio interview and I had to listen to the radio interview before me, right? Mm. And so the woman said, I've been talking about fires all morning. She said, now we're going to put that aside. We're going to pull out our crystal balls and we're going to look at the year to come, 2020. And let's uh, let's look into the future. And what do you think is going to happen with Brexit? And what do you think is going to happen with Donald Trump? And I'm here to answer all your burning questions. Mm. And I don't think that she <laughs> meant to say that. And so I was waiting to go on, and I was going to say, "Well, is a <laughs> she?" And I don't think she meant it. And I was going to say, "Well, as a flaming homosexual, <laughs> I often get burnt out on these tours." Stop adding fuel to the fire. <laughs> but it was one of those things where they're followed by traffic report and then the weather report. Oh, and then by the time you get back to it, it's all forgotten that she said burning question. Oh, shit. Oh, God, that makes me so happy. <laughs> I hate myself that I love it so much. Uh, it really uh, tickled me that in your master class, you said one of your um, big comedy inspirations was Whoopi Goldberg. I saw Whoopi Goldberg's Broadway show on a uh, – we had a videotape of it. Mm. And I bet I watched that thing mm. – oh, I don't know. I must have watched it 50 times. Mm-hmm. And and what was so great about it was she did these characters, but you would be laughing. Mm-hmm. And then the next second, you would be like, like punched in the stomach. Yep. And she would just turn on a hair. Mm-hmm. And, I, and whenever people – I don't know. I won't put up with any criticism of Whoopi Goldberg. None. None. First time I met her, went on The View, cried. Lost it. I mean, just loved her. So much started crying. On air. (laughs) It was wild. She, uh, I said something nice about her in the New York Times. And then this box of cookies showed up. I was in Sussex. It was hard. I don't know how she got my address. And it was shipped, like, immediately. And then she said, if you're in New York... Let's go out. For, let's go out and have dinner. And so I was going to be in New York for a few, in a few weeks, and we went out to dinner. And I'm not good about meeting people, but she was so gracious mm-hmm. that she took all my nervousness away from me, mm. and was just lovely. But the waitress was from Romania, mm-hmm. and I said to the waitress at one point, I said, "Oh, I just speak a little Romanian." I said, "But it's filthy." What I know how to say is filthy. <laughs> And she said, say it. And I said, no, that's okay. And she said, say it. And I said, no, it's really bad. And she said, say it. And so I said it. And what it is is I shit in your mother's mouth. (laughs) And then the waitress is like, why would you say that? Why would you say that to somebody? And I said, well, you asked me. And then Whoopi's like, wow, what's going on with her? Because Whoopi was talking to, (laughs) you know, somebody had come up to, you know, say hello to her. And (laughs) she didn't. And all of a sudden, I've alienated the uh, the <laughs> server at this restaurant. But she was – that Broadway show that she did, mm-hmm. and, and it really – I'd been writing for about – I don't know. I'd been writing for like probably seven years by the time that I saw it. But I was just writing in a diary, and I hadn't written – really written stories yet or right. essays or anything – and it really had a profound impact on me because I, I watched it and I thought that's what I want. I don't want to 
perform. I don't want to memorize anything. Mm. I'm not an actor. I just want to read out loud, but I want to make people feel like she made me feel. Mm. She also is so incredibly kind. Uh, Last time I did her show, she dragged me into her dressing room and forced me to pick one of her shoes to take. She collects these fantastic shoes. Hmm. She has them made. Uh, I'll show them. I'll show you. I still have them. They're like in a shrine in my closet. And uh, was like, you're taking these. You know, she just is like the kindest, biggest hearted person. And also just the most relentlessly authentic. Have you seen on The View that she just farts whenever she wants? <laughs> will you find? No. Will you pull this up? Oh, she will fart on The View and they'll air it. I mean, they don't even, she doesn't even care. Which one is this when Claire Danes is on? Watch this. Stories that really talk about our experience post 9 11. And it's, um, our identity was really questioned. And I think it, it explores that in a really smart way. Um, well, you know, you, oh, oh, I was going to say. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so nice. Oh, excuse me. I'm a little frog out of there. <laughs> I would have never admitted to that. I would have acted like, you know, my chair made a noise. She does it all the time. That is fantastic. She does it all the time. I would, whenever I'm in a bad mood, I watch it. I send it to people. Whenever, like, someone's going through a breakup or a divorce, I just send them that video. It totally makes their day. (laughs) Also, Claire Danes is talking about 9 11. I mean, it's just like, of all the times to fart. <laughs> oh, God, it's my favorite thing on the planet. <laughs> oh, God. But I, I think a lot of people <clears throat> maybe don't know about that show that she did. You know, that maybe Broadway not. show that maybe. she did. And it's what put her on the, on the map, yeah. really. I mean, I also think people forget she was a movie star. Yeah. I mean, she was a, when I was growing up, she was a movie star. I mean, those sister act movies and... I mean, Ghost. I mean, isn't that one of the biggest movies of all time? Yeah, I think so. God, she was so incredible in that. Um, I'm looking at your notebook. I'm sorry. I just have to bring it up. This is a really big deal for me to see your notebook. Are you ever worried you're going to lose it? I've only lost two. Can but you I think finding that notebook? <sighs> no, I think most people wouldn't. Like, I collect grocery lists. You know, I find them outside the grocery store. I love that. But I don't. I, I think I'm the only one who does, you know. I mean, I don't think other people collect them. It's probably if I lost my notebook, nobody would even think about it. I don't know that they'd look in here. Or I don't know that they would, you know, would be able to, um, I'm always so know. worried because I, my, I am stupid and I send emails to myself as my oh, uh-huh. notes. But, you know. I, I also have all these groups, email threads, like, you know, Whitney podcast producers, or and then I'll sometimes write all of these sort of uh, little nuggets of jokes and then send it off. And I'm like, where are those? And I realize I've sent it to like my Ooh. lawyer. And it's like, it's just bullet points that are like herpes, rusty IUD, <laughs> freeze eggs next week. It's like my to-do list. Freeze and- egg next week. That's really good. Because sometimes... <laughs> People say, will you sign my diary? And then I always make their to-do list. (laughs) You know, and it's like, get an abortion. Freeze eggs is really... (laughs) Freeze eggs is really good. Or de-thaw eggs or visit (laughs) eggs. Don't be a deadbeat mom. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember Janine Garofalo was uh, on... I saw her on stage a couple years ago, and she she was like, I just lost my journal, so if you see anyone bombing in St. Louis, (laughs) 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 tell them I want my notebook back. (laughs) So, <laughs> you only do your sort of entries. You write them out. You don't ever do anything in computer. Mm. These are just little notes. These are little notes. And then every morning I write in my diary. Uh huh. And computer? so I pull out. Yeah, and I pull out my notebook and I and I look at my. <clears throat> I usually think like at what moment yesterday did I feel the most alive, mm. and then I start there. And then I go through all my notes and, you know, sometimes it's things in the news or it's, you know, like um, uh, like Kirk Douglas died the other day. Mm-hmm. You know, so I put that in my diary. Yeah. But it was like number seven, the thing in my diary. But, uh, but I always, I don't know. Can I ask how it works? You wake up, you make a coffee or a tea. Do you look at the news online? Uh, sometimes I read the newspaper in the morning in bed, 
But then I just get up and I go to my desk and I, you know, I drink coffee and I sit at my desk and I always start by writing in my diary and then I turn to whatever else it is that I'm working on. Mm-hmm. And how is your uh, digital hygiene? Do you have a phone? Do you get on the phone? I know I have a relationship with the telephone. Wow. Uh, I mean, I, I do things on my laptop and I have an iPad. There aren't a bunch of distractions, it seems like. Sure. I mean, like with anybody, you know, I can Google something or look at a website, but I I don't know. I don't go overboard with that. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I seem to act like there are 10 websites. Like, I don't... Yeah, me like, too. And yeah. like with YouTube, uh, I'll look at something on YouTube and then I'll forget it exists for like five months. Hmm. I just completely forget that it exists. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know. I don't have a lot of time to do that. What websites do you go to? Uh, you know, like the New York Times or the Washington Post or uh, that that what's it called? It's it's these men Porn, who criticize Pornhub. what people are wearing. Oh, um, uh, go Tom and Lorenzo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't always agree with them because sometimes they're like, oh, his his. Uh, jacket should be like a quarter of an inch higher and i'm like really that's what you're <laughs> that and and i don't agree with them a lot but i like to see what people are wearing i suppose there was an uh, a, pod, uh, a website called the satorialist oh I, I can't believe i literally was about to say that but i was too worried i was going to mispronounce it so only but i feel like a lot of times what the people are wearing is their beauty yes and so i don't think that's quite fair well i think that's such a great website because it's kind of just people in the wild that nailed yeah. it you know, just like really chic people in different parts of the world. And just when you're like, oh, yeah, you can wear like white pants and a white shirt. Everyone looks so effortless and sexy. But I was surprised. The only time I've ever commented on the computer, mm-hmm. it was this Italian guy. And he was and and he was wearing a sweater, like a green sweater. And he was wearing a pair of culottes from Come to Garçon. And he was wearing a, a collar that Come to Garçon made that you... It was like a patent leather collar, like a, a baby doll collar that he mm. had around his neck. And and all these people, because usually they're really friendly on that website, yeah. and they were all ragging on him. And what's that thing he's got around his neck? And I wrote, I wrote, and I used my actual name because I didn't know, and I didn't have anything to be ashamed of. And I said, oh, that's a detachable collar by coming to go And I, I couldn't believe that nobody knew what it was. And then I thought, <laughs> maybe you people don't know as much. As I always thought you did. But now I think it's just an Instagram thing. Yeah, yeah. And that's too bad. Do you go on Instagram? Yeah, every now and then. And then I forget about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I forget that it exists. It There's a guy named William Cult. Mm-hmm. C-U-L-T? Yeah. Huh. And he's British. And he, and he posts things that really, they can be funny and they're disturbing, but they really make you think. I like him a lot. That's nice. But you don't have your own page on there. Like I do, but I've never looked at it. Oh, that's interesting. I don't think I don't have anything to do with it. I love that what you say about um, your diary is to always keep a diary in case you need to um, go back and check people. Basically, so you can win arguments. Yeah, <laughs> it's really good for that. <laughs> is that such a nightmare for you? <laughs> well, for Hugh, because he doesn't. It was interesting because. I pointed out lately. I mean, we we had a discuss, uh, an, well, an argument a while ago, and I was able to go back in my diary and see that he had been on this kind of jag for like a good two months. You know, it wasn't just <laughs> you got the receipts. Yeah, but to look back and see, because he only writes in his diary when he's depressed, mm. and then he'll say, "I haven't been happy for a long time." Mm. And it's like, because you only write when you're miserable, and that's what you're looking Ooh. at, you know? I also love, um, you said somewhere that you never bicker in public. I try not to. Ooh, that's such a good, like, relationship life hack. Well, we may, I mean, we're not always perfect for that, but there have been a couple of times that we've really, I mean, they're worse people, but yeah. that just makes everybody really uncomfortable. And uh-huh. So sometimes you just need to eat it, and then you just wait till the company leaves. Right. And then you can have it out, but never in front of people. Do you get sick of asking um, or hearing people ask you why you haven't gotten married? No. I don't know. You know what? I think uh, I think the thing is that I met 
so many gay people who would say, and this is my husband, Bradley. And I thought, <laughs> and I always thought, I don't want to be that. I don't want to sound like that. So, <laughs> so I didn't get married. <laughs> oh, I, um, I really, uh, it really resonated with me and, um, in your master class, uh, it sounds like they're paying me. They're not. I truly watched it and, and loved it and <coughs> literally took notes. Um, when you said that people would come up to you and say, like, wow, you really hate your family. Yeah. I get that, too, when you're like, no, I, I you know, it's just it, that was such a fascinating thing just about navigating how to write about your family in there. But I think so many people, I mean, it's interesting to hear people on the phone and you don't hear them on the phone the way you used to mm-hmm. because now people text and everything. Right. But on the phone, everyone would say, I love you, I love you, I love you. And, you know, they'd be on the plane before you take off, and they're calling everyone and telling, saying, I love you in case the plane crashes, I guess. And But that's <laughs> the way they think, that if you yeah. don't say, I love them, mm-hmm. so-and-so, then you don't love them. Mm-hmm. But I, I read somewhere, it was the other day, it was something in the newspaper. It was an op-ed in the New York Times, and I don't remember who it was by, but... It was This woman was talking about, oh, I love you, I love you. And the guy said, look, I said it to you 30 years ago when we got married, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought... Well, further notice, I love you. It yeah. just goes without saying. Which, I mean, to me, it's completely the opposite. I usually say I love you when I've done something super shitty to try to fix it. I'm like, you know, I love you, right? Like, can we erase every all the shitty behavior I just did? Gosh, I can't remember the last time... I told anybody that I love them. I really can't. I don't... Because you just show it instead of... Yeah, I feel like it. I don't don't feel like I have to... You know, you can say it in other ways. Mm -hmm. Gifts, you know. Yeah. Or... or, I mean, I'll write it. You know, the writer George Saunders, Mm -hmm. I really have so much respect for him. And he's such a great writer. And... We were emailing each other about a project, and he wrote back, love. And I thought, wow, that's really great for a man to write to another man, love. And I thought, I'm going to start doing that too. So I do it all the time. Like to, you know, if you're sending back an email to somebody to say love at the end of it. Mm. And so, okay, I'll say I love you that way, Mm. you know, at the the end of an email. But I'm not going to say, like, I love you. You and Hugh don't say I love you? Hmm... No, uh, sometimes I'll say, do you love me? (laughs) (laughs) But it's more of a jokey thing, you know? (laughs) That's such a trap of a question. There's no way you can answer that without getting in trouble. Of course I do. More often is, do you remember when you loved me? (laughs) I say that a lot. How long has it been? 30 years. What's your biggest piece of relationship advice? Never. Say I love you. Talk about your relationship. Ooh. That's that no way. No wonder I'm single again. That way lies madness. Wow. You never talk about your relationship, wow. either privately or to a therapist. Mm. Never do it. Wow. Yeah. Incredible advice. Don't gossip about your partner, basically. I oh, no, no. You can advice. gossip about it. No, you can oh. talk about it to other people. Yeah, oh. you just don't talk about it to that person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, you no, mean, no, no. Wait, you mean never talk about your relationship with the person you're in the relationship with? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I thought you meant to other people. No, you tell other people everything. <laughs> and I've said that to Hugh. I said, I want you to talk shit about me to Manuela and to your other friends. You need that. You know, yes. you need that. And you can say whatever you want about me. But you and I are never going to talk about this. Really? Because it's just masturbatory or nothing ever? It just, it's, it's the beginning of the end. Mm, It is basically don't go to the problem for the solution. Yeah. Don't, and then, I mean, we'll joke about it and I'll say, can we go to lunch, just the two of us? I want to talk about our relationship, (laughs) but I'm just kidding. That's so wild. When did you discover that? Uh, With my, with my last boyfriend. Wow. Yeah. And I realized... Because you're never going to – I'm sorry, but I don't – I don't know that you're ever going to change somebody or you're ever going to necessarily fix something. If somebody's terrible, 
and they make you feel awful all the time, you should probably leave. But I'm just so grateful, you know, I will put up with anything. I mean, pretty much because I just don't want to be single and I don't want to have to look for somebody else and I don't want to break somebody else in and <laughs> catch them up on everything. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I say to Hugh, like somebody's got to stay together. Why not us? I mean, that's a good enough reason to stay together because someone's got to do it. It's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> it's just so incredible. Um, I, uh, it blew my mind, although I'm so, you know, I know this is going to give people so much hope, but that you said in, the, in your class that you wrote every day for 15 years before your first book got published. Mm-hmm. That is just so wild. Really? It seemed perfectly normal to me. Mm. I mean, that seemed what you would do. Like, mm-hmm. you, you know, you start writing and you stink and you think, well, of course I stink. I've only been doing it for three days. Mm. And then I've only been doing it for three years. Yeah. And I've only been doing it for 13 years. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I didn't put a timer on myself. Did you put a timer on yourself for your career? Hollywood probably did. But I don't know if I did. I had a really lucky thing happen where um, I just, in a fortuitous turn, I happened to be somewhere with... um, uh, um, That's kind of a weird story. Um, uh, I happened to be backstage with a very famous comedian who said to me, you can never make it too late. Hmm. Just said it to me at the exact time I needed to hear it. Uh-huh. And it was just like, don't rush this. This is the one thing that, you know, you, you're just going to get better every day. And that was really helpful. You know, I think uh-huh. I just need, I think I needed to hear that. And as a comedian, uh, you can never make it too late opposed to being like a actress or something. You have to make it really young. So I then got really sort of uh, paranoid about making it too early and not being cooked enough because someone else said to me, uh, you can never take back the first time people see you and the first impression you make on them. Does that make any sense? Yeah. You know, I always think that like, um, you know, I'm going on this tour right in the spring. And so I have three new stories so far. And you can only read something first one time. Right. So when you go out on stage, do you think, is this the audience? Because if you read it on stage and nobody responds, me, I'm going to say this sucks. I'm never going to read this again. Right? Mm. Um, <clears throat> so you have to be careful. Um, you have to be careful where you try something. Yeah. But, yeah, that that is... I'm always puzzled by that, especially because, like you said, if if you're like a model, right, and you say, well, you know, I'm 75, you know, maybe it's time to hang up that dream, you know, but (laughs) if you're a writer. There's Viagra commercials. There's plenty of things for older models to do these days. But if you're a writer, um, then you, you know what I'm surprised by? Mm -hmm. And and this is just something I've noticed, and it's so interesting to me. People who, okay, people probably told you at a young age, they said, you're funny. Okay, did they not? I, the only problem with me is I wasn't trying to be funny. I was trying to be serious. Oh, uh-huh. And then I ended up being funny. So that, it wasn't mm. exactly what I was fishing for, but it, it eventually got to me, yeah. Because I just seem to know some people lately, and and they've decided, like, in late middle age, I'm going to go do improv. I'm going to start doing stand up. Yeah. But it's like no one ever told them they were funny. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and that would be like if you just decided, I'm going to become a model. And no one ever said to you, Are you a model? Or you should be a model. I just think it's something people would have said to you. Yes, yes. You have to have some kind yeah. of encouragement or it has to peak your – yeah. And I also kind of got weirdly lucky because my – and I don't know why this is the case. I think it was just – this was back when Blockbuster was big and uh-huh. you would get like a Blockbuster movie and we never – were. there was a couple Blockbuster movies we just never returned because uh, we couldn't afford to pay the fee or whatever and we'd watch the same ones over and over again. And one of my heroes was Roddy Dangerfield. And I just loved him. And he was one of the only comedians I had a lot of exposure to as a kid. But I remember hearing somewhere that he made it when he was like 55 or something. And that just always stuck with me. 
you know. It's it's nice how things like that can give you hope. I mean, it can give so many people hope. The fact that somebody, you know, made it later on in life. Then you can think, okay, I'm not... Because I just meet a lot of people at readings and I'm like, calm down, you know, calm down. You're 24. Yeah. No one gets a book published when they're 24. You know, you're you're doing exactly what you should be doing. Yep. You're just working and failing and learning mm-hmm. from it and trying something else. Don't leave the rest of it up to other people. Yeah. And just go get interesting, <laughs> I think is what, you know, I remember Gary Shandling saying to me, just like you're only going to get more interesting. You know, and that your material as a comedian at that age is kind of going to be like your style or your haircut at that age. You're going to look back and be like, oh, God, what was I thinking? Which I kind of loved. I just needed to hear that, I think. Well, I th- what my fear always in writing is to look like I'm trying. And so when I look back on early stuff, mm. I just see somebody who's trying too hard, mm. you know, Um and that kind of changed when I started reading out loud a lot because then you prove you can get a laugh and then you say, okay, now what would be like to not get the laugh? Mm-hmm, which and is then, so fascinating. And you said, was it your dad that said don't force it? He says don't force it like, don't force it. Like, don't try to force that cup into the dishwasher. Don't try to <laughs> force. Uh, so he meant it like that. He didn't meant like, don't oh, right, try right, to right. force a joke. <laughs> well, I just, I think in, in performing, you know, stand-up especially, the harder you try, the less power you have. As soon huh. as they start to sniff out any desperation, they recoil and they know that they have the power. It's some, like, human nature thing. See, I can't imagine doing stand-up. I can't imagine having what it takes to do that. No, because I like to read out loud, and that paper makes all the difference in the world, that Mm. piece of paper. No one has ever heckled me because I have a piece of paper in my hand, and I have a tie on, and I'm standing at a podium. And and Well, no, people just respect you. They just don't respect me. (laughs) No, I, I know. I think it makes all the difference... There's a reverence, I think, for you. No, I I don't know. Like when I first uh, – no, I don't think that. I don't think it's that. I think it's just a piece of paper. I think it's yeah. simply a piece of paper. But there also could be some training of hearing you on NPR for so long. You know, no one was allowed to yell back at you. Like when hmm. I hear you, I get really quiet. Huh. I'm like – you know, I listen to you before you could even rewind. It was like if you – shut up. Everyone shut up. He's talking. <laughs> you know, if you interrupt, you're huh. going to miss it. So I think there's a little bit of a Pavlovian reaction when I hear you talk. Even now, I'm like so afraid to interrupt Gosh. you. <laughs> huh. Have you ever wanted to try stand-up? No. I, the closest I get is when I go out on a tour, mm-hmm. there's a question and answer. At the end. At the end. And sometimes people are slow to answer, to offer questions. And so I start doing shtick. All right, just, you know, I'll talk about something that happened uh, earlier in the tour mm-hmm. and then you know how that is and you tell the story and then you think gosh it works even better when I add this to it mm. and then so over the course of the tour I'll develop a couple minutes worth of sh- and it's never anything I would write mm-hmm. you know what I mean like it does it's not writing it down would make it a whole different thing and it's not necessarily even worthy of being written down but I'm always a little bit embarrassed because I think if somebody had come to the show the night before, they'd be like, wait a minute. That's what he said. I mean, that would be hard, I think, as a comedian, if somebody films your act and people yeah. see it and then they see you, it's like, oh, I've heard that joke already. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is really the great uh, nightmare, <laughs> I think, for, for comedians that, you know, someone sees the same thing twice. Um, but at the same time, it is, you know, is part of it. You know, I think it's not like music where people want to hear the hits. You know, people want to hear the thing they've never heard or be surprised, which is why now we kind of have to do those bags. You know, when you go uh-huh. to a stand-up show, now you have to put your cell phone in a bag so people don't record and put it on the internet, you know, because we have to try so hard to keep it a surprise. But if, I, and if I'm if i on a tour and I meet somebody, let's say I'm in uh, Lawrence, Kansas, and they say, I'm coming to see you again next week, in St. Louis, I'll make a note of it, and so I don't repeat myself. Really? Because, and I wound up doing the entire show mm. from one person for one person in the audience mm. because I don't want to repeat myself to that person. Oof, that is so wild. Um, uh, bonjour, fresh. 
Bonjour. That sounds good. Bonjour fresh. Anyway, Mouth-watering <laughs> seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your dough with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh makes cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable, and you know this. Get out of that rut. With HelloFresh, is 22 uh, season and plus. There's more than 22, but <laughs> there's 22 plus. I thought that was a bra size. I got confused. <laughs> um, something for everyone. What You do HelloFresh. I do. I, I'm doing the calorie counter one right now. How's it going? It's very fun. I've had butternut squash. Ooh. I've had some chickens. Chicken. Everything's been great. Very easy. Very, very easy. It's already pre-portioned, so there's no like prep, and you just throw it all together, and all of a sudden, you're a chef out of nowhere. Everyone I know does this. Yeah. I mean, it's really super simple. They give us. I thought you were going to say more. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to. You love this company that so. Was a statement. You're always telling me about your goddamn hella fresh meals, <laughs> and now me. you have nothing to say. All of a sudden, <laughs> now you're quiet. <laughs> He's <laughs> always talking about these freaking hella fresh meals, and now, <laughs> now all of a sudden, you made a Helen statement. Keller over here. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 10good and use the code 10good for 10 free meals, including free shipping. We're very confused by this code, but we love this company. HelloFresh.com slash 10good. Use the code 10good for 10 free meals that are good. It includes free shipping. <laughs> Who picks the code? Us? You know what really bothers me? When I see someone's dog, and I'm like, what kind of dog is that? And they're like, I don't know. It's a mix. I'm like, bitch. A mutt. I want to know exactly what kind of dog it is. Yeah, what if you want one? Get the, I tell them. get. There's an intest called Embark, and you sw- send a swab of spit so I don't have to keep wondering what kind of dog you have. Really bothers me. Yeah, it's funny you bring them up. They're a sponsor. <laughs> What? Yeah. No. <laughs> Whether you have a new pup or an old friend, an Embark breed and health test is the key to unlocking your dog's unique breed mix and genetically informed health needs. I'm just going to say this in my own words. I don't really need to read it. You have to get genetic testing for your freaking dog. That way you can find out what they're predisposed for. Skin problems, stomach problems, joint problems. What are you doing? Yeah, and it's, you want to know what their history. Where they, what, what kind of yeah, you want to know they? what they're bred for. You want to know why they keep, you know... Trying to eat your panties. Maybe it's a certain, it's a breed thing. Who knows? Figure out your dog's breed. You improve their quality of life because you know what they're predisposed for. You can tell your vet, oh, this dog is, you know, half, you know, staffy, half German Shepherd, half... Pomeranian. Cat. Yeah, whatever. (laughs) And then they can go, oh, great. Your dog's predisposed to this. This saves you money in the long run. And your dog's going to live longer if you know the crap that they need. Uh, I wish I knew right away what Frank was. I wish I had known he was a Great Dane. Yeah. Then I would have known. He's I, outgrown the living space. I know that I have a donkey growing in my garage. <laughs> right now, Embark has an exclusive offer you can't get anywhere else. Go to EmbarkVet.com. Now use the promo code Cummings to save 15% off your dog DNA test kit. Visit EmbarkVet.com and use promo code Cummings to save... <laughs> Um, I have a couple uh, questions that were sent in from the old internet. Oh, really? I have one question that's from Justin Thoreau. Oh. Yeah. Do you know Justin? Yes, I do. His question is... He is so funny. He guy. is so funny and it makes me angry. And I really love how, too, how he can do any accent. He's a friend of my sister's. Yes. And how he can just do any act. He's the life of the party. That Always. Yeah. So funny. So quick. It makes me jealous and kind of angry sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't seem fair that he can That's right. act, like mm-hmm. really act, and he can be that person as well. And he's like a dog person, and he's it's, it's, it's very frustrating. But he has a question for you, which is, I would like to know why you don't invite me on trips to Tokyo. Oh, gosh. Shopping trips? On yeah. Tokyo? Oh, I, we would love to have him. <laughs> we, see, we couldn't go. Amy couldn't. <laughs> Amy couldn't come with us this last January. We call it Japanuary. Yeah. <laughs> and so we go every Japanuary because she was filming her show. Yeah. But we rent a house, mm-hmm. a whole house. So, gosh, I'd love to have In Justin Tokyo? along sometime. Yeah. He's, because he's, y- y- you need a guide when you go to Tokyo for the first time. Mm-hmm. And if, like, I know people who have said, oh, can I go to Tokyo with you? And it's like, what are you interested in buying? And they say, no, I just want to see Temple. Don't come with me. Because you've done that. He, Hugh, like, I don't know, probably, I don't know, 14 years ago, 
I said to him, this is the last temple I'm ever going to. Hmm. And I've never been to another one. I All I care about is shopping. Yep. Yeah. What's and Justin, uh, he was, he's a great dresser. Unbelievable. I'd love taking him around Unbelievable. to shops. And what is your number one item you go for? Clothes? Uh, yeah, clothes and pottery. I don't know what's going on with me. I really don't. I, I don't. <laughs> like clothing-wise? Okay, I bought a jacket a couple days ago. And, it, and it's a black wool, but not heavy wool, yeah. right? Like maybe, it just looks like material to me. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and it's like a jacket, a sport coat. But then from under it come layers of ruffles, like just layers Ooh. and layers. And, and, and it, you can't get blacker than black, but this seems to be something that somebody in Gone with the Wind would wear when they're in deep, deep mourning. <laughs> and I... I don't know that it's for me. Do you know what I mean? Why not? But I can't not buy it. Buy it. And it must weigh 15 pounds. Love it. And so it's too heavy to travel with. But I was with Amy and I said, I can wear it to dad's funeral. And she said, that's like, <laughs> that's like the 10th jacket you've worn to wear to, wear to dad's funeral. That you bought to wear to your dad's funeral. You yeah. can have changes. You can have to- <laughs> You can go full Oscar host. I'm going to have so many costume minutes. changes at my dad's funeral. <laughs> <laughs> so you ship stuff back. You go to Tokyo and ship stuff home. Uh, well, we shipped things one time and things didn't come. So now I just try to carry it. But this time I went to Tokyo and then I went to Hong Kong. Ooh. And then I went to Australia for a tour. Right. So I shipped things home from Australia. Hmm. It must be impossible to buy a gift for you. No, I don't think so. But, you know, one thing that's nice about... Like, Hugh and I are back, and we got a place in New York. And I, I wouldn't say we've moved back to New York. We just have a place there now. Mm-hmm. Um, and you walk around, and it's empty storefront, empty storefront, empty storefront. Mm-hmm. In Tokyo, I have never seen an empty storefront. And you can go anywhere to the far edge of town and get off at the subway, and there are these towers in the subway station. And they're, they're towers, and they're stores in the towers, right? Oh, like wow. Like... A boutique for this, a boutique for this person, and and it's packed. Yeah, and you go there on a weekday, and and you think, how are so many people in this building? And that's just one at the f- far edge of town, and it's like that all over. And it's really, really beautiful to see people. I don't know; they don't buy things online. Yeah, and they their apartments are small, and so. They get rid of stuff and they buy new stuff and they're just constantly buying stuff and I'm all for it. It's so hard for me to get out of my head and it's so hard for me to when I'm, you know, which I related so much in your in your class because I'm just always when I'm talking to someone, I'm always like, how is this a joke? How is this something? How is, is this a scene? Is this mm-hmm. a tweet? Even with Twitter now, I'm like, should I tweet about this? Should I post this? It's so hard for me to be present. And the last time I felt like I was truly in awe and completely present was in Tokyo at the robot restaurant. This might huh. be too lowbrow for you. Have you ever been? No. Can you pull up the robot restaurant? It is a show in Tokyo. It, I mean, even watching the videos on YouTube is fun. And it is all of these like giant, sparkly dinosaurs and pandas and lights. I mean, it is the most wild experience I have ever had in person. You go inside and, I mean, everything's mirrored and the lights are crazy, but fast forward to the show. I want to see the robot restaurant show. All these robots start fighting each other. It's so cool. This goes on for like two and a half hours. Wow. It's the wildest thing I've truly ever seen in person. It's the only thing that's ever made me want to put my phone down. And be present. We, well, you know, it's always so interesting to me that, uh, you know, when you live in the United States and you hear this is the greatest city on earth, it's like you need to get out more often. <laughs> you know, like there's a <laughs> lot of competition for greatest city <laughs> on earth out there. Right. You know. Right. I was in Sweden recently, and Swedes. Not everyone is like this in the world, but Swedes are raised to believe that they live in the best country. On Earth, yeah. and that they have the best health care, and that they have the best this mm-hmm. and that, and it's interesting to go to another country and realize that they're told the same. That's so true. Thing that you're told, but 
I think so many people, and it's just, you know, and I understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's expensive to travel, but they really need to get out a little bit more. Yeah. Right? <laughs> what is your favorite city to visit? Uh, uh, Tokyo. Yeah. Second favorite? Uh, I like, uh, well, I like all of Germany. Mm. Um, I take pretty much, you can go to Mannheim, Germany. Mm. Uh, and still spend $400 on postcards. Oh, wow. Germany is is the the world capital of really good postcards. Really? And when I say good postcards, I mean joke postcards, like cartoons on a postcard, uh -huh. and it's all in German, so I don't understand it. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. You know, like I, there's this one that I got, and it's all these nudists – Eating hot dogs in an <laughs> outdoor cookout, and I don't know, I don't know what it's about, but the drawing is fantastic. And I and there, sometimes you go like if you go to the Art Institute of Chicago to buy a postcard, uh -huh. it's like they're printing them on receipt paper now. Right. You know, they're so they're, they're not good to send. Right, right, right. But they're a good thickness, and I'm always happy mm. to buy a postcard mm. because I I send so many. And I, I go through them a lot. Those cards were like the first meme, you know? It was the first, like, joke in a square, I feel like, that we had. You know, now they do an Instagram. You have, like, a little meme that's, like, a little joke. That's really what a postcard was. Well, like, even New Yorker – like, if New Yorker postcard – New Yorker cartoons were postcards, if I were – especially if I were not American, I'd buy those by the thousands. Yeah. Because I – because they're pretty and you don't understand what they mean. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. That's what I look for in a man, actually. <laughs> Another question I got for you. Are you religious and do you pray? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. Uh, I'm not. And even I am not spiritual. You're not spiritual? I'm not spiritual. You sure? And when people, yeah, no. I'm not any of that. Even when, see, even when shit hits the fan, are you a person, if something goes wrong, you start going, hey, God, just checking in. Uh, I went to a doctor a year ago, and he said, you have cancer. And I did not say anything to God. Interesting. I don't have cancer. And that maybe that made it easier. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if it had been an accurate diagnosis, do yeah. you think maybe... <laughs> I mean, I felt, you know, I did feel kind of sorry for myself. God was but, like, never mind. He's not going to check in. Well, all I ever asked is that my cancer be above the waist. That's all I ever asked, <laughs> right? Because I don't want people imagining. Right. Like, wouldn't it be awful to have rectal cancer? And then you're embarrassed to tell people what kind of cancer you have. And it's That's so, right. As if to add insult to injury. Yeah. You now have to think about my cancerous rectum. Yeah. yeah. Because then people are going to imagine what kind of plumbing thing is going on and... <laughs> And then it's so unfair that you have cancer and then you don't get any of the benefits. No, none. No one feels sorry for you. They're just grossed out by you. So this was bladder <laughs> cancer, right? And so I thought I'd make myself a new one out of one of those goatskin sacks, you know, that <laughs> people drink out of when they go to Greece, you know, when they're a teenager. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know why you can't <laughs> make a bladder out of a goatskin sack. I'm sure. That, I mean... But it turns out I'm I'm okay. And he was the doctor was just wrong? He was just wrong. But That's what's wild. crazy is he led with that. Wild. I said, I have a urinary tract infection and there's blood in my urine. He said, well, you probably have cancer. Jesus! You have bladder cancer. Is this in England? Yeah. You have bladder cancer or you have prostate cancer. And then, and then come back in like three days and we'll run some tests. And then I'm back on the street and everyone's waiting for that day. And I thought, wow, I didn't know today was going to be that day. But it wasn't. <laughs> what were those? He had red hair. <laughs> I'm never going to go see a redheaded doctor again. I actually, I have so much compassion for redheads because when I went and froze my eggs, I started looking at sperm donors and I got really into these sperm donor sites and I found out that maybe it's just certain companies but these sperm banks don't accept sperm from redheads. Oh, 
<laughs> and it broke really? my heart. It just broke my heart in oh, half. Oh, that's not fair. Isn't that horrific? Gosh. I mean, I would label it. You know, I'd label it. <laughs> Viking. Scotch-Irish. <laughs> no sperm from redhead. Isn't that Gosh. heartbreaking? They, like, don't even bother. <laughs> Isn't that awful? That really upset me. That really is. Can you imagine going to try to donate sperm to, you know, try and help a woman? Well, plus, you know, I think maybe people are... If you put Prince Harry on the label... <laughs> he's I mean? a prince. That's different. It undoes the redhead. Yeah, but he's yes. a good-looking guy. Yes. You know, yes. he's a really good-looking redhead. Strapping. Yeah. Yes. So maybe people are thinking other redheads. You mm-hmm. know, maybe they're just not... Enough yeah. positive re- uh, representation. That's for true. It's like uh, royal redheads is a different kind of DNA, I would say. <laughs> Isn't that sad? That really upset me. That made me want to just go, you know, buy some redhead sperm just to make <laughs> someone feel better. Someone really wants to know how you quit smoking. I told myself that I was allotted a certain number of cigarettes at birth and that I went through them all. Huh. And if I'd smoke more slowly, I would still be smoking. But I insisted on smoking two packs a day. So I went through them all, and that's it. I can't. And I did the same with alcohol. Wow. Like there are rooms full of alcohol, you know, like beakers that would be like the, the size of this room. And there were like five allotted to me. Mm. And I emptied all five. And it's like, sorry, you finished it all. And it really helped. That's incredible. Most people who quit smoking quit like many times before. Mm-hmm. And so they have a history of failure. Right. But I'd never tried to quit. So I had no history of failure. So I think that made it easier as well. Hmm. That's really intense. Uh, someone really wants to know when you were a judge on RuPaul's Drag Race, was it scary? No, everybody who worked on that show was lovely. Every was so single, yeah. every single person on that show was lovely and they made you feel so welcome and I didn't want to say anything bad about anybody because this is their dream Mm -hmm. right and they don't know who I am and so who am I to get up there and shit on their dream but they didn't make me say anything bad Mm. you know I just said good things about the people I liked and and they were all fine with that Mm. and it was uh, you know, I was a big fan of the show, so I'd seen every episode, not just once. I'd mm-hmm. seen every, every episode many times. And, yeah, everybody. And then I ran into RuPaul a, a couple months ago in London. And it was at a freeze art fair. And I had tickets to go to one part of it. And there are two parts of it. And I didn't want to bother him, right? Mm-hmm. And I didn't expect he would remember me. So I was just with a friend and I was just quietly. And he said, David Sedaris, where do you think you're going? <laughs> and it was so nice. And I said, well, I'm going to this one. I don't have tickets for this. And he said, well, come with us. You know, we have, we'll get you in. And he had like some super VIP. And you know how that is. You're thinking, okay, when we get in there, what's going to happen? Do yeah. I? <clears throat> and we got in and he said, okay, kids, you're on your own. And I thought that is the perfect perfect way Mm -hmm. to handle that yeah he really has he's really just you know a a really lovely person and i i always just think it's so great when someone is completely themselves Mm -hmm. and and the world says great we we really especially when you wouldn't have expected it. Like in your youth, you wouldn't have expected that someone like him, who's yeah. being completely himself, the world would fall for. Yeah. And I can see how that really gives hope to so many people, not necessarily drag queens, but just, you know, anybody who, who, you know how you can always spot a phony, you know, like, yeah. and, and, and it's like you spot it in writing, too, mm-hmm. when somebody's like taking a political position that you think, that's not really your political yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're just trying to please me or you're just trying to like, – you can sure always, was, yeah. always tell when somebody's not being honest that way. Um, and I never spotted a moment of that in RuPaul. And there's also something about seeing RuPaul in the world. It's like seeing a giraffe. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, there's times that I've seen him walking into something, and there's 
it's just it's like he's in his own he floats down the street. <laughs> I remember one time I saw him walking uh, into a dinner party with uh, he was in all white and a bright ruby red bag. And it just was like, you're just such on a such a different level. <laughs> It's like this divine floating deity into a party, you know? It's very intimidating to just run into RuPaul. Well, like I said, I didn't expect him to remember me, and so I didn't want to, I don't know, I didn't want to hold him up or anything, and that was so kind of him. You know You know another person who's kind, and I just always, I think about this all the time. <clears throat> I'm not comfortable on TV. and I'm, Really? I feel like you're always so good on talk shows. no. <clears throat> it's not doesn't come natural to me, mm. but I did Jimmy Fallon, mm-hmm. and Reese Witherspoon was on. She was the main guest, yeah. and I always take my friend Andy's daughters on TV when I go. I've known them since they were born, and I always bring them with me. And at the time, the girls were like twelve and thirteen years old. And Reese Witherspoon came to my dressing room with a bowl of nuts. <laughs> we all had a bowl of nuts in our room, but she acted like these were a present for me. <laughs> and then she. <laughs> And then she saw the girls and she said, girls, do you think we could get a picture together? And the girls never would have asked. Oh, and that was such a classy thing so to do. Sweet. Yeah, I always think of that. She didn't have to do that. She didn't have to. And she didn't wait for that. They Again, they would not have asked. And it was just such a classy thing to do. That is such a cool thing to just get ahead of it because they would never. Yeah. Oh, that is just so cool. I even try to now take someone's phone because I think sometimes you see someone all of a sudden when they come to take a picture, they don't know how you, to use their phone all of a sudden. I, I just grab it and just take it so that I know it's going to be good. Huh. Light, lighting's going to be good. and you know, How do you um, react when people want to take photos of you in public? I don't like having my picture taken. And it bothers me when people take your picture like you're a statue. Mm. You know, like they don't ask you or anything. Mm. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that kind of bothers me. It just seems really rude to me. Right. So if somebody comes up and says, can we get a picture? I say, oh, I'll draw our picture. And I'll pull out my notebook and I'll say, I draw a picture of us together. And I'm happy to talk to people, but I guess I just don't understand what the picture means. Yeah. You know, it's like proof that they saw you. They want proof. Yeah. But it's just so interesting. So I'm always like, do you think someone's going to think you're lying? Right. If if you say you saw me, like, right. why do you need the proof? Are you a, just a liar normally? Well, like I had heard that Kevin Hart, when he went on his book tour, he took pictures with people. But uh-huh. he, he just stock signed books. Right. And then took pictures with people. And I guess that's what people wanted. Then they could get a picture of themselves with Kevin Hart and put it on their Instagram account. But I don't know. I'd rather talk to people and I'd rather I'd rather do it that way, you know. Very famous comedian I know uh, used to say, you know, I won't take a picture with you, but I will talk to you for five minutes. And not one person ever took him up on it. <laughs> really? Yeah, they just wanted the photo. Wow, mm-hmm. that's interesting. Sometimes people get really mad when you don't want your picture taken. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then I don't – you know, it's like when somebody comes up to get a book signed and they say, I want you to write Keep Laughing. And I say, you know what? I would oy, never write that oy, oy. in the book because it makes it sound like I think I'm funny. Yeah. And I I wouldn't I wouldn't I just wouldn't do that. That's so like a lot of people ask me, like, can you flick off the camera? I'm like, no, why are you making me look like an asshole? <laughs> now I look why are you making me a jerk in this photo? Well, I'm sorry, but also you're the professional. Yeah, I got you it. You know what I mean? Like you're the funny person in the relationship. They came and paid to see you. Right. So <laughs> You know, and so, okay, let's say you say to me, will you write, keep laughing? Okay. And I'll say, no, I won't. But I'm like, I'm happy to draw a picture. And I'm going to say, you know what? Actually, I'm going to draw. You have a sister, don't you? And they say, yeah, I have a sister. And I say, I'm just going to draw a picture of your sister. (laughs) Put that in the book. (laughs) But I mean, I mean it in a really good way. I don't think my sister doesn't shave her legs at all. That is the most horrifying part of all this. <laughs> has very perky tits, though, and great nipples. I mean, I lo- and cankles. The cankles are a little rough. <laughs> are she wearing cowboy boots? Can you believe I went to art school? <laughs> yes, I can. This is so, like, 
like genius. Oh no, she had a knee injury. She had a bad knee injury. She has a. That's a sports injury. Yeah, that's yeah. a torn ACL. Right they didn't there. heal heal correctly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but she had some vaginal rejuvenation, I think. And then what are these? Are they just floating nipples? Just no, that was just, I was, I don't know, just, that's just nothing. Randoms. We were talking earlier and I just... Can I keep this and so Of course. On? Last couple of questions I know. Do you have to leave tonight? No. No, I'm I'm here to do, uh, I'm going on television tomorrow. Ooh, what show? Uh, Jimmy Fallon. Oh, nice. I'm Jimmy uh, Kimmel. 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 Jimmy yeah. Kimmel. Kimmel. Who's a lovely person. He's the best. Love him. Uh, and then I, 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 I show got canceled because of weather in, in Northern California. So I have to go make that up. And then I'm just mm-hmm. going to do a show in Vancouver and then go back. Mm-hmm. To, then I'm going to, uh, Argentina. Ooh, nice. For a vacation. Oh, are you good at vacationing? Like good at taking the time? I mean, I work every day yeah. on vacation, but I'm going with a, a, a really old friend of mine. So how many days? Uh, we're going to go for a week, but we're going to go to Argentina. Now, this is a hard thing, okay? C-H-I-L-E. Chile. Right. Chile? But then you sound like an asshole when you say Chile. 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 Ch- it's not chili. Right. You're an asshole if you say you're trash if you say that. And if you say Chile, you're right. patronizing. Right. So I'm going to Argentina. <laughs> y Chile también. Y Uruguay. Después. Wow, that's sexy. Uh, Always go sexy when in doubt. Just be sexual. And then I took Spanish in high school, and I'm boning up on my Spanish. Ooh, now. excuse me, excuse me, sir. In this climate, you're going to talk to me like that. I'm, I'm, and I remember a lot of words, but so I'm trying to refresh myself mm. on my verb agreement and things like that. But you know, that's been that's a really great conversational starter too. Like this morning. Uh, there was a fellow in my restaurant, and I said, "I said, uh, do you speak Spanish?" And he said, "Yes." And I said, "How do I say uh, I'm looking?" Because I remembered I'm looking for my friend. And is this how I say it? And he said, "No, you say it like this." And but it's great, yeah, because it's it's a really everyone's happy to do that. Mm-hmm. Everyone's happy to impart their knowledge, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, no, I think so too. And um, are you listening to tapes or some kind of yeah. refresher type yeah. thing? Which one? Pimsler. Okay. But it's interesting because I've used Pimsler whenever I go anywhere. Like, so I went to Sweden mm-hmm. and I studied for Swedish for a month before really? I went. And Romania. And I studied Romania. And, you know, it's just for a month, but hmm. in Romania, our driver dropped us off at our hotel and said, it's a, on the pedestrian street, it's just up the next block. Well, it was actually a mile away. But my Pimsler let me said, do you know where the so-and-so hotel? And when they said, go straight and turn left, I knew what they were saying because I... Right. right. And so I used it for I used it for Japanese and for Polish and for uh, wow. uh, German. And Is German the hardest to learn mm, if you're American? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you speak other languages, yeah. then you kind of get an idea. Like, if you don't speak another language, you're like, wait a minute, the noun has a gender? You know, but yeah. if you speak other languages, you're, you are you know you've already got that part down. But well, what did that have anything to do with? You asked if... That you're oh, to Argentina. Oh, Timsler. Yes. Right. But I've noticed, like, with... Because I've used it for so many languages, and usually it follows the same pattern. Mm. But the Spanish is like, I'm sick. My mother and I are sick. My entire family is sick. Those are always the things. Do you know they a doctor? You. Do you know a good doctor? And <laughs> they took your master class. They're asking good questions. But they're just. But the other languages, no one says. I never learned I'm sick in Swedish. Because they have great health care. <laughs> well, I guess. Like you'll never have to ask this. But question. you're just expected to get to drink contaminated water. <laughs> In a country that where you speak Spanish. Yeah. They're basically like Montezuma's Revenge. Yeah. How do I deal with the fact that I can't stop shitting is like the first question they teach you. Yeah. It was just really interesting kind of to me. <laughs> well, it it really is interesting because I yeah. – but the German one was meaner than others. Really? And, and, it, <laughs> and it's like uh, – like you I, – I learned to say, I don't understand you. Why? <laughs> I don't understand you. And then you, – you say why? Because you don't speak German. Like they don't. None of the other languages 
or were that like confrontational. That. Yeah. yeah, but the German was like, you're arguing with a waiter, and it's like, <laughs> that's not right. You still owe me like 15 euros. And but they didn't, you know. In Japanese, you never argue. No, with a waiter, no. You know, that's so funny. But also, the Spanish I think was done recently because it's the only one that has taught me the word email. The other ones are like, do you have a telephone book? Oh, wow. And you really need to update it. Do you have a fax machine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's wild. That is so telling. But in a country like, uh, you know, if you go to Romania, mm-hmm. like I was in Serbia recently. Wow. And I said, who are your immigrants? And they're like, nobody. And I'm like, <laughs> nobody comes here. <laughs> no, Syrians, you know. Syrian refugees, like a Syrian refugee wound up in Bucharest, and then he thought he was had made it to Austria. And they said, no, you're in Romania. And he cried, and he put his shoes back on, oh. and he had walked like 800 miles from Aleppo. And so you go to some, a lot of these countries in Eastern Europe, and and everybody's white because nobody wants to immigrate there. What's Serbia like? I saw a banner with pictures of of young men on it, oh. and it was. And I said, uh, "I said, were they killed in the war?" And the driver I hired said, "No, they is all kidnapped by Albanians who steal parts, like maybe some alcoholic need a liver, maybe somebody somewhere need a kidney." And so I said, "Oh, I said they're." organs were harvested so i'm like giving, him a, <laughs> giving someone an english lesson you know at, but <laughs> but that's <laughs> the phrase you're teaching them their organs were yeah, harvested. yeah we have this <laughs> in america we know we have a word for this <laughs> oh god why are they on a billboard because they were missing no because they were killed kidnapped and then their organs were harvested and they died and so they were just put on a billboard just thank you for for your service, or? Uh, no, it's just like, oh, this is sad. Oh, got it. Yeah. Oh, bummer. And then Jesus. I went to Bosnia. Welcome to Serbia. I went all to of Bosnia. Our liverless children. To a hotel that was out in the countryside, and it was like a village of yesteryear, right? So they had farm animals wandering around, and but they had like artificial streams, and then they had you know those bridges that are like half a circle. Yeah. You know, that go high over the water yeah. that were covered with moss and wet leaves and they had no handrails. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so my no. friend Patsy fell on no. her ass no. and slid down. No. But you can tell when you're in a country that doesn't have a word for lawsuits. Oh gosh. <laughs> and also it's interesting to go to a restaurant <laughs> in twenty twenty and the all of the eight people next to you at breakfast are smoking. Oh. Because we're just so not used to nope. seeing that anymore. Or when someone doesn't even ask if you want a non-smoking room. Right. Like they don't have any non-smoking rooms. I think I was in, I want to say Kentucky last year performing and someone was smoking inside. And it was such a trip to see. I think that might be the last state where you can still smoke inside or at least in comedy clubs or something. There was something kind of sexy about it. I kind of it's missed funny it. funny <laughs> how quickly that all uh, changed. Yeah. We were going to go. I have a friend who I travel with a lot. And so I just was writing an essay about this. So I've been going back. Not you, Justin. Diaries. But uh, we were going to go to northern um, Macedonia. Mm. And she found us a hotel. And it was like the best hotel in town. And under amenities, it listed toilet paper. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> you know, you expect like. A 24-hour fitness center and spa. <laughs> yeah, business center, toilet paper, water. Toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Macedonia. I will not put that on the top of my list if that is a luxury. I'm going to ask you a couple more things before I let you go. Sure. If you need to leave, I know I'm going to fight tooth and nail to keep you as long as I can. You made this observation once that I just love so much about how when you learn an animal's name, you make a judgment about them. Mm. So you don't ask people their pets' names or else you would make a judgment. That is so fascinating to me. That happens with children a lot. It's so true! It's so true! I mean, I'll have someone come and get a book signed and I'll... I'll Sign this enjoy for my kid, them. Tyler. Oh, 
Well, even like, uh, do you have any children? Just one. Our son, Kevin. <laughs> K E E V A. But sounds my like favorite an was Draven, which sounds like the past past tense of drive, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like we were Draven to the restaurant. <laughs> I make a judgment about the parent first, though, too, because I'm like, yeah. what kind of asshole will name their kid this? Yeah, it really, it's loaded. Yeah, it's so wild. And where do we get that from? Just our sort of in our hippocampus, we have judgments about names from people we knew who already had those names. No, it's such a weird stereotype. But again, no, I think part of it is, you know, like the whole Atticus mm-hmm. thing. I grew up in North Carolina, and so in North Carolina, like, what's your mother's maiden name? This is wild, and a lot of people might not believe me, but my dad's name was Eric Cummings, and my mom's was Patty Cumming. Huh. And they got married, so it's Cumming Cummings. Huh. Okay, because your name— Sure, there's some inbreeding there. I don't know, but that was it. So it's Cumming and Cummings. My mom's maiden name was Cumming with no S. Because often in the South, your mother's maiden name would be your first name. Mm-hmm. So there was a formula to it. But then people started thinking, well, gosh, what would happen if I took Stephen and just changed it to a K? You know, Keevan. That yeah. sounds good. And so <laughs> and so these these bullshit names. Too much moonshine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> cropped up. And that's what's – you know, this has been always interesting to me and it's a really hard thing to – you and I spent Thanksgiving with this trans woman – uh, last year, mm-hmm. and she's 70, and her name is Madison. Now, there's no 70-year-old. No name Madison. Madison. No. Nope. You know? and, but it's like with Caitlyn Jenner, that's, a young, that's a, a young woman's name as well. Caitlyn. So you never meet, like, she didn't think Ruth. Nope. You know? Bonnie. <laughs> yeah. Esther. Bonnie. Dot, and that's Dottie. really interesting to me <laughs> that... You can't be an 80-year-old Kaylee. No, you can't. <laughs> And that's why when you're working on something, uh, the name really matters. You know, the name of a person really so matters and because the name is going to tell the reader how old that person is. And sometimes what area they're from yeah. and so many things. But I also find that um, there is also, even within normal names now, people are doing these creative spellings. Like sometimes I'll be oh, yeah. s- signing books and it'll be Ashley and I'll be like, no, A-S-H-L-E-I-G-H. And I'm like, no. But a lot of times if you ask, it's like the mother allowed them to change the spelling of their name. The parents did when the kid was like 14. Hmm. That happens a lot. That's wild. And you should never, never allow your child to change their name or the spelling of their name. Huh. Because – and when they're 14. Because that's when you make the worst decisions of all. Of your life. I used to lick batteries when I was 14. (laughs) (laughs) I shouldn't be making any decisions. You go back to North Carolina a lot? Mm. We have a house on the beach there, so mm-hmm. I go there when we go to that. And my dad's still in Raleigh, so, mm-hmm. you know, I'll go and see him. There's a wonderful comedy club outside Raleigh in Cary. Uh-huh. It Cary? Yeah. Yeah, right outside? Yeah, I think it's an improv. It's brand new. It's gorgeous. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Because I grew, grew up in Raleigh, so I met somebody a while ago. Uh, I was on a book tour and I met somebody. I was in North Carolina, and I said, where do you live? And he said, I live in Cary. And he thought I wasn't familiar with North Carolina. And he said, that's like the Beverly Hills of Raleigh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there is not a Beverly Hills of Raleigh. There just isn't. Like there isn't a Greenwich Village of Raleigh. It's like the Soho of Raleigh. Yeah. There's not one. <laughs> that's amazing. Um I guess the last thing that I sort of want to bring up, I, I was so, you know, I, we talk about addiction a lot on this podcast and something you said um, in the master class that was so touching to me that I had never heard it put this way. I've spent so much time in, you know, I talk about being an Al-Anon and dealing with family members that um, are alcoholics and addicts and stuff, uh, myself uh, identifying essentially as an addict. You said something that was just so simple. And I think it's so important for all artists and just people in general to think you said, um, a lot of alcoholics are good people. Yeah. Do you remember saying that? Well, I wrote a story about my mother's drinking. And my mother was a really good person mm-hmm. who was an alcoholic mm-hmm. who couldn't stop drinking. And it didn't make her a bad person. It didn't make her a bad mother. 
uh, it just made for a sad story. Mm -hmm. You know, when you to think that somebody, because maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think you can be that happy and be an alcoholic. You know, speaking as someone who's an alcoholic, um, I I just felt trapped and I just felt like I was sinking and I just felt like there was no, uh, every day was the same, yeah. you know, and, and a lot of days are going to be the same sober, mm -hmm. right? But there's still a possibility that it can be different when you're sober. If right. no other reason, if you drink, I mean, you drink that much beer, you can't go anywhere. Nope. Because you got to pee. That's right. <laughs> like every three minutes. <laughs> so you true. can't really go anywhere. That's right. And then I would get high on top of it, and then I would be paranoid, and I couldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. It just it, and but, <clears throat> and I think about that all the time. Like how great it would have been. You know, if my mother could have quit drinking, yeah. just how how much better her life was. Because it was just and, – and luckily she wasn't like that all of our childhood. You know, it just got progressive and – but and we loved her. Yeah. And I never doubt that she loved me. And it was just – but I don't, I don't feel the need – I don't know. I don't I – don't, I don't judge her mm -hmm. for it. I just... Did you spend time, like, learning about the disease of addiction, or it just was you knew in your heart? What, about my mom? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, I just knew, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, you just saw it. Yeah, and just, I mean, knowing that it's not really a choice, that it's a sort of chemical dependency over which she doesn't have control when you're like, oh, okay, no one, you know, it's taking me a long time to learn, no one wakes up and chooses to be an alcoholic, <laughs> No one wakes up and is like, you know how I want to spend my day isolating and drinking and, you know, not getting anything done and then feeling consumed with shame the next day. It took me so long to realize that it wasn't a personal attack on me when other people drank. <laughs> it took me so long. Well, her dad was an alcoholic and he, you know, had shock treatments mm. and, you know, the whole, uh, the whole nine yards. So she grew up with that. Um and, but it was the kind of thing, I mean, nobody, like, I never said to my mother, like, what can I do to help you? Like, yeah. you've got to stop drinking. I, and we were all afraid to say that. And if you, um, even my dad didn't say anything, yeah. you know? But, okay, so, like, somebody needs... Uh, Somebody, I feel like somebody needs to have an intervention with me and just say, look, you really look awful in those clothes. You know what I mean? You you really look awful and you can't you see it. need to stop buying Renaissance yeah. ruffly capes in Japan. You can't see it, but everybody else sees it. But if they said that, I would think, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. I would deny it. Yeah. And so it's not going to change until I say... Okay, but one of the things I got when I was in Japan, it's a pair of matador, not is mat, not flamenco sleeves that yeah. are detachable. Yeah, detachable. Yeah. And so there's elastic on one end, mm -hmm. and there's a cuff on the other, and you okay. can put it on over another shirt. Yeah. Because let's say you had a flamenco. They make the shirts with the whole flamenco sleeve. Yeah. But let's say someone said, come on over, we're having tacos. You'd be like, fuck, <laughs> I'm wearing my flamenco shirt. I can't eat tacos. <laughs> but... This way, you just take them off. Snap them right off. Yeah. yeah. And you can have tacos. Oh, and, and then <laughs> you can do the dishes. This sounds like how an alcoholic rationalizes behavior. <laughs> yes. No, I see how you need an intervention. I see the parallel. Or let's say your yeah. paralyzed sister <laughs> says, will you change my tampon? It's like, well, I have my flamenco sleeves on. I can't be doing that. But you just take them off. <laughs> Oh, God. I appreciated that so much. Um, do you have any questions for me? Uh, well, what are you going to do tonight? Tonight, I'm going to stay in and probably uh, spiral about all the questions I feel like I forgot to ask you. I'll probably spend a couple hours just consumed with, you know, shame and paranoia. Of, I should have asked this and I should have asked that. I'll probably do that for a while. When's your next show? Uh, tomorrow night. I do shows pretty much every night. 
Where, in where are you going to be tomorrow night? Tomorrow night I'm going to be at the Comedy Store huh. in uh, L.A. How long will you be on? Uh, tomorrow, when, when I'm in town, when we're up at the Comedy Store, we really only do 15 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, just uh-huh. work, working on new stuff. And then I don't start going on tour until March. And that's when I think about when you go on tour. I have your tour dates. Here. I go. I think I start April second or something like that. And then, um, and then you're on tour. You do what is this? Twenty, thirty cities? This is a lot of cities. I think it's like forty five or something. Oh. Usually, it's like forty five. This is a wild number of cities. Does Hugh come with you? Oh God, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Going to Rhode Island, Norfolk, Lexington, Kentucky. You might be able to see Lynchburg, Virginia. Oh, look at you. But you, you know, like when I was young, and I would, you know, you would watch, like, say some late night show yeah. and then somebody would say I'm going to be playing tomorrow I'm going to be playing in in uh, Davenport, Iowa and you'd think oh man you loser <laughs> but you know anybody can it's not that hard to fill a theater in Los Angeles or Chicago or New York if you can fill the house in Davenport yeah, that's saying something no this is a big so, deal I'm looking at these dates yep Northampton, Massachusetts, yeah, you Princeton, you don't you don't make it easy on yourself. But and it, and I think people really appreciate, you know, that you go to, you know, the smaller cities as well. Milwaukee, fantastic, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Miami, Florida. That's going to be hectic. Well, the thing about a small town like that is it's not not a nice hotel. No, oh, trust me. Oh, I know. And when people say like, "Oh my god, I how know. do you do it? How do you go to 45 cities?" When you're at the Four Seasons mm-hmm. or the Mandarin Oriental, it's yep. not that hard. Yep. You know? <laughs> but if you're at an Amera Suites, mm-hmm. and there's this fellow who I know who will come to see me a lot. Excuse and, what? and I always give him free tickets. That sounded weird. Oh, no, come, come to, to show. To the show. Okay, yeah, okay, he okay. comes to show. <laughs> and I always give him free tickets because I get free tickets to everything. Sure. And he stays in the worst places. Mm-hmm. And he stayed at the Amera Suites. And there was shit on his shower curtain. No, he went, no, 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 no. And he Human went to the shit? front desk, yeah, to complain about it. And you know what the guy at the front desk said? It wasn't mine. <laughs> Can you I mean, believe you... that that was, that's not an acceptable answer. I used to tour so much. I used to do about 80 cities a year. After I'd been doing stand-up uh, for a couple of years or got my first special, I bought a house. It was so important to me to buy a house because I grew up in around alcoholic home, a lot of noise, hectic. I grew up in an apartment a lot with people above us. All I wanted was quiet. So I buy a house and I had no idea about property tax, inspections. Mm. I buy a house and I have about $15,000 cash total left over. <laughs> so I'm basically house poor. So I go on tour. I do 80 cities in a year. I'm doing colleges, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then going to do clubs, doing two, three shows a night. On July 4th, I'm in Las Vegas, and I'm staying at a place called the South Point Casino, which is off, the, like 10 <laughs> miles off the strip. <laughs> it's known as being the home of the penny slots. <laughs> you go in there, it's like The Walking Dead. People are limping around. The buffet is like Chinese food and chocolate pudding. I mean, it is the most, it is a sad scene. And I'm there on July 4th, which is already performing on a holiday is already kind of sad and lonely. And I'm like, you know what? I need to get some air. Because when you're in Vegas, you can be inside for like three days and not notice. You start going a little Jack Nicholson in The Shining. You start going crazy. So I'm like, I need to go outside and get some fresh air. I need to just go to the gym. I go down to the gym and I go into the bathroom to pee and I smell puke. You know that that puke smell where it's just like sour and and I smell it right away. And I'm like, oh, God, someone must have puked. Keep moving pee go up to the wash my hands and i'm like that's that's pungent i mean it's like an effluvium of really like sharp puke and i looked down and i had actually stepped in human shit wow i picked up my shoe took it off without thinking put it in the sink started scrubbing it like full uh out damn spot lady Macbeth. i mean with but without even thinking about it and then just started hysterically crying and just like, oh, just, like, I just had a full, like, meltdown, went up to the hotel room and called Southwest to try to cancel the show and get out of there. I couldn't get a flight out. I ended up talking to this woman on Southwest Airlines for about 45 minutes, crying about how I just touched human shit. And uh, she got me through it. And we still email to this day. Huh. Crystal, hey. And there is something about seeing someone else's shit. That just something snaps. It's like a primal thing of like, I've worked too hard to smell someone else's shit. Have you been to China? Yes. Hong Kong. You see, No, Hong Kong didn't count. Oh, okay. Mainland China. Then no. You see turds 
<laughs> everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. And I went in January, so yeah. they were frozen. Yeah. <laughs> and I was at a lake, and I thought, oh, those people are ice skating around sweet potatoes. No. <laughs> they were turds. And every day, I saw so many turds. And you would go into the bathroom, and there would just be turds on the toilet. <laughs> People would just leave them. I mean, they wouldn't flush. They would just leave it. For, I'll leave it for the next person. No. And nope. I saw it was just interesting to be in a place where you saw that many turds. Maybe it's like, you know, like we're divorced from where our food comes from. Oh, totally. You know, but, but uh, this this was it, it just made you think well i guess we're all just basically animals yes correct you know well i just have so many questions it's just like i have to wipe after i mean like what what happened right. there well it made me think of I, I was reading something about how when you pick up trash so often you find soiled underpants yeah when you're picking up trash which is just tells such a story i mean so many people shit their pants yeah i found underpants with turds in them nested <laughs> nested in them <laughs> And okay, this is it. I found a pair of, in the in the rain, a pair of briefs with a potato sized turd and slugs feasting on the turd. Yeah, feasting. So, do you have like tongs or something? You have some kind of. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. you have a whole thing, and you got gloves on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You look full dex. No, I don't have gloves. I mean, I have them if I you need must them. Must have an incredible have immune my... system. I have gloves in my backpack if I need them, uh-huh. but I carry a lot of bags, so I can take that, sure. dump the turd, take the <laughs> underpants, put some leaves, mix some leaves yeah, in there with yeah. them, put them in a plastic bag, put that bag in another bag. Oh, my. So, and then dispose of it. I'm fine with dog shit. I look at dog shit. I pick it up. I, horse shit. I grew up around horses. Human shit. I just, I can't do it. Well, it's funny how you can always tell it's a human turd. Always. Always. Why is that? Why is that? Is it the size of? We just know the. It's the color of it, and it's kind of a crust that forms (laughs) on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so true. What it's our processed foods we eat, or something, the coffee. But, uh. (laughs) (laughs) Well, now I'm going to ask what I know everybody is thinking, which is why don't you have a podcast, and are you going to ever have one? I think it just takes too much work. Mm Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. To have a podcast. I mean, I think a lot of people, I like podcasts. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have podcasts, especially when they're sitting around with their friends. Yeah. And they're kind of talking, but it's not as interesting as they think it is. You know? uh, that's what I say. And everyone argues with me. I'm always like, God, how is this interesting to anybody? And then people always tell me, especially comedians, they're like, ah, oh, they just want to hear a conversation. Doesn't have to be that interesting. And I'm like, I feel like I'm bombing. Well, you know, like one of the podcasts I like is I like the Dana Gould Hour. Mm. And he puts, you know, a little really? Hollywood history mm-hmm. lesson in there. And he, I don't know, he seems to put a whole lot of work into it. Mm-hmm. And I always laugh. I mean, I always find myself laughing out loud yeah. listening to that. And most of the other ones probably are. Did you ever listen to Super Ego? No. Oh, I think I've subscribed to it. What is it? It's Matt Gormley. Is that his name? I can Matt? look it up. And and just some other improvisers. It's familiar. And they're really, really incredibly skilled. And, uh-huh. and it's funny in a way that nothing else is funny. Is it's, it live? Uh, they've done a few live shows, but usually I think they do it in a studio. Jeremy Carter in Long Beach. They do it. They've done 79 episodes. I'm going to get that. That's really funny. I like hardcore history, too. That's That really, he puts a lot of work into it. Huh. I mean, that's like a four-hour sort of thing. He writes a lot. But, you, God, you would just, it would be the biggest thing. Gosh, I don't, I mean, maybe if I had guests, but it would be guests like this fireman that I know. Well, that would be the most interesting. I, mean, that I would know this be the, guy in England, and he's like six seven, and he is so handsome. <laughs> It does. It doesn't. He's a freak almost. He's uh-huh. so handsome, and women, you know, just just fall for him. Yeah. And he loves women. Yeah. And he, I don't know. He would be a, like the first guest on my podcast. And you're just gonna ask. Like him. we went to a restaurant together, and he said this would be a good place to take birds. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily hear British people say the word birds. 
<laughs> bird means hot, hot girl, or is that like our chicks bring chicks? Yeah, yeah. But is it pejorative? No, no. It's just kind of old fashioned. It's a great place to bring some cunts. You can't it just, say that. It's just old fashioned. Yeah, you know, bring some birds. And I had I don't know that I had heard. And so, and there's a cashier at the supermarket that I go to. This is already the best podcast I've had. How have you not started this yet? And I wouldn't mind her as a guest. Yeah. I suppose. But I think they would just be, you know, normal people that I would have on. It's just so wild to think about. I mean, Morning Edition, we were talking about this earlier. It had like about, it was like averaging 10 million listeners. Yeah. I mean, that's three times as big as any scripted comedy show right now on television. Yeah. But I went from, I think the biggest audience I'd have was 500. But that wasn't just me. I was on a bill with other people. Oh, a lot. So I went from 500 to 10 million. So (laughs) that was quite a leap. Did you know at the time when you were doing that how many people? I never listened to Morning Edition. I wasn't always asleep then. I listened to All Things Considered. Yeah. But to me, part of having a good life meant being asleep when Morning Edition was on. Yeah. Because it comes on like, I don't know, at 6 or something. It starts. So, uh, um, yeah, it just, that's a lot of, that's a lot of people. Um, And it, yeah, I mean, it just, but I'm not even on it that much anymore. I mean, I have a show, my own show on the BBC. Mm Mm-hmm. And I do that, but I'm, I haven't been on NPR in years. Yeah. Uh, but still people remember things from it, which is nice. What do you watch? Do you watch shows or? I told myself I can only watch any kind of a TV show if I'm on the elliptical machine. Okay. So I put things on my iPad and then I go to the fitness center. Okay. And I was the, the last person to get. Not a doctor. Um, I was the last person to get, yeah, to get Netflix, the last person. I've had it, like, for six weeks. <laughs> and there are great shows on That's there. A, yeah, yes! <laughs> I'm here to tell you. There's some really you great shows. You don't say! Yeah. <laughs> what have you discovered? A Master of None. Yeah! Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a really good show. Uh, what else like, did I you watch? You guys have got to watch this show, Seinfeld. <laughs> Friends is this new show that just came out. It takes and, place in the nineties. It's a period piece. And sometimes I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> you know, start watching a show and then abandon it. Uh huh. But then there's just an, always another one to pick up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. No, it's great. Yeah. So Master of None, you like? Yeah. Uh, Do you just, like dramas? Yeah, I like drama. I, I like. Succession. Do you want oh, Succession? Oh, unbelievable. My favorite show on TV. Everybody on that show oh, is an asshole. killer. But what I, saves it is the writing is so good. Brilliant. That you can't. And the performance is yeah. just unreal. Yeah, I really like that. I like there are a lot of shows that I have ideas. F- uh, I mean, I'm not a TV person, but okay, The Walking Dead. Yeah. Right? Like I like uh, to see a zombie eating somebody. Yeah. Right? Okay. So I've st- stuck with The Walking Dead all this time, right? <laughs> but... All right, and this is a really good idea. There would be nothing scarier. If you had a choice between uh-huh. opening your door and finding a lion there. Or a zombie. Or finding a chimpanzee. What kind of lion, male or female? Uh, the let the most savage lion that was, like, wounded and Ugh. hungry. And a chimpanzee. Yeah. I feel like I would choose lion because it would kill me faster. Whereas a chimpanzee- it would just kill you different. But the chimpanzee, the thing, the thing about chimpanzees killing people is that they would bite your face off. Like, why yeah. would you start there? You know what I mean? It just seems like a weird place, <laughs> I, like biting someone's head. Uh huh. And and if you're a guy, they rip your balls, your balls off. They know to go straight for the dick. So here's what I think. Okay, in the zombie apocalypse, <laughs> yeah. Chimps escape from zoos, mm-hmm. and they all formed a big tribe. Yep. Now, on The Walking Dead, they don't have guns anymore. That's your enemy right there. Chimps. Chimps. Like, Are chimps there... could completely destroy every. They can get over that fence with no problem. Here's the biggest question. Are there zombie chimps? You wouldn't even... Uh, well, a zombie chimp would just move like a zombie. So it <laughs> oh, wouldn't yeah, really, it'd be a slower I mean? chimp. Okay, yeah. got it, got it. But it's the move, fast-moving... And like, 
That's such a good idea <laughs> for this show. <laughs> just chimps versus humans, like Game of Thrones, just yeah. chimps and humans. Please go pitch a show where you're like, I have a really good idea. <laughs> chimps just rip people's balls off and faces. <laughs> Welcome to my master class. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I don't have ideas for that many shows, but yeah. every now and then I think, gosh, they really need to hear from me. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Where That is almost as good as – I remember when I heard the idea for Snakes on a Plane, uh-huh. and I was like, we should all just pack up and go home. Yeah. A bunch of snakes get loose on a plane. I can't imagine anything more terrifying. Than Hollywood's over. Pack yeah. up your suitcases. <laughs> they did it. It's a, You can't follow that. Okay. But, but, uh, chimps on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> chimps on a cruise ship. Chimps on a cruise, cruise ship, ship is perfect. Chimps on a train. Chimps on a cruise ship. That's the best idea. He's I would go overboard him. immediately. Um. Did you hear that? Uh, this is funny, I thought. Uh, where did I hear this? Oh, it was on, a, it was on YouTube. Paul Lynn, uh-huh. you know, who used to be on uh, Hollywood Squares. They, and he was such a queen. And when I was young, no one would ever say they were homosexual. But you looked at Paul Lynn and you just knew as a gay man, you thought, oh, he's a gay man. And they said to him, if a man falls overboard and people yell, man overboard. What do you yell if a woman falls all overboard? And he said, full speed ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. I hope to see you guys in the comments for that one. I have so much more to ask you, but I can't keep you this long. Now I'm just being selfish at this point. I have no idea what time it is. It's 2 a.m. <laughs> wow. Forever. I miss dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're both in a low blood sugar. So good thing I got you actual sugar as one of your thank you gifts. I, I put a very weird gift uh, bag together for you. I hope you like it. That was so kind of you. I yeah. really appreciate that. No, it, this is an honor. I, we've had a lot of very fancy people in here, and you are definitely the person that everyone has geeked out over really? the most. Yeah. Gosh, I never expect that. Yeah. People. Everyone never... is just completely geeking out. Uh, oh. Uh, and not only that, but before you came, we're usually goofing off and horsing around and just being dickheads. And before you came, everyone was just like really silent, <laughs> nervous, oh. and panicky. Gosh, that's so odd to me. I don't ex- ever expect. You're a legend. You know You're what I don't think is fair? Somebody accused me recently. He said, you know. You abuse your power. You know, you're, you're signing books and you abuse your power. Who said that? I was somebody who, uh, you're a comedian. So uh, let's say if somebody told you something, mm-hmm. right? And, and it wasn't something like about somebody else. It was like something that, maybe something they did or whatever. Okay. would you use that on stage? Yeah. 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 Oh, so, okay, so his point was you're taking the stuff people share with you and using it on stage yeah. as an artist. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, my whole thing is if is the second you come up and speak to me, all bets are off. Everything you say mm. can and will be used in material. Well, I feel, too, that if you don't want me to repeat it, then say, don't repeat it. And I, yes. And it's not like I used a person's name or anything. Right. <clears throat> so I don't, sure. I don't. And I think it's different if you're uh, – because like you said, I, I mean one thing I feel the same as you is that – I mean I'm not a comedian, but I mean you're always looking for things and you're yes. always looking to connect things and yes. you're always looking for a story and you're mm-hmm. always looking for – and it's – I mean, I think as a writer, I mean, it's sad, but I mean, you're really kind of exploiting everyone and everything you you come into contact with. Everyone's fodder. Yeah. yeah. But I do think people don't always like having a mirror held up. It's uncomfortable. You know, sometimes acute observations are feel like attacks to people. But I I, but I but it's just interesting. I feel like power so often is in somebody else's eyes like it's not in your own. You're not sitting there thinking like. 
I'm the most powerful person in this room. Mm -mm. You're not. You're just sitting there and you're so grateful that people came. And they have, I don't know, it's almost like they have the power because if they stop coming. That's so true. Then you're nobody. So you're not sitting there thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like fame is that way too. Like fame is other people's idea. I'm not. Fame. I mean, I'm not famous, but I'm talking about if I meet somebody who's famous, that's something I'm putting on them. Yeah. They're not – it's my idea of them being famous. They become like a Rorschach test or you project. You kind yeah. of project – projection machine. No, it's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, and we've actually talked about this, you know, before on the show. I think it's when uh, maybe Jim Jeffries was here about – Especially the stuff we talk about and the stuff that, you know, um, you know, we write about. We tend to go into risky areas that trigger people. You know, there was a uh, when Jim Jeffries was on stage in Australia once he did a joke about suicide and someone ran up on stage and punched him in the face. It's this. Why will you pull it up? I think we've even. Why would they punch him in the face? Because he probably just walked into a hornet's nest of someone going through something crazy. And, you know, I think a lot of times when we talk about things that are. Is this it? Yes, he made a joke about suicide and someone just ran up on stage. This is before he got really famous and attacked him. Wow. That, that person wild? really is attacking him. Isn't that wild? <laughs> you just never know what pain you're walking into. You never, no, you don't. You never know what personality disorder you're walking into or what mental illness or what. Well, that's the thing, too, about a trigger warning because you don't have any idea what's going to set people off anymore. That's right. You know? That's right. Any idea. Mm-hmm. And so I don't. I just sometimes feel like saying, if you have a problem with anything, you should leave. Mm-hmm. But don't leave while I'm here. Wait till I'm done. <laughs> Wait till my performance is over, and then you can leave. <laughs> but I don't know that people are more sensitive now. I Agreed. think it's just it's free became free to complain. Uh, yes, and, and because it used to be, you'd have to put a stamp on it, and mm-hmm. you would think, is this really worth it's free to complain? Thirty five cents, and then it became free. Yeah, and then so people, it's like I went and saw your show. And I went to get a Coke, and I said I didn't want much ice, and they put a lot of ice in it. I was like, you, I can't believe you're wasting your finger oh, writing that. Everyone just wants to be heard. It is really wild. And, and not only is it free, I think it actually gets you some clout or something. People get a couple likes, and they're like, yeah, look at you standing up for yourself. Like, look right. at you, you know. Um, and it's almost rewarded at this point for complaining. I don't know what's wrong with me. I just don't get offended. I mean, I don't... You don't internalize it. No, I get angry sometimes, but I can't think of... But I think you also, I was thinking about it as, you know, I was watching um, your class and you were talking about how you observe people. And I feel like when you're as observant as you are and as good of a writer as you are, you always have to lead with empathy. Like, you're not necessarily internalizing what people do because you're kind of seeing them as a character in a story. You know, that's usually how I'm able to get out of it. Hmm. Does that make sense? It's almost like a non-judgmental meditation is, is how it felt like. Well, it's the kind of thing, too, and you don't want to be formulaic about it, but, I mean, it seems like if you're going to give other people a hard time, <clears throat> you know, you kind of need to be hard on yourself right. as well. Right. And so sometimes people are like, oh, then you did this and this thing, and I didn't like you anymore. And it's like, well, that's just a chance I had to take. Because you know? mm-hmm. usually it's the worst things you can admit that most people can relate to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's wild. And I do find uh, I started every now and then uh, I've started responding to people who come at me oh really hard. Uh-huh. And uh, <clears throat> I would say 95 percent of the time. I'm so sorry. I didn't think you were going to see this. <laughs> huh. I love you so much. I didn't mean that. Sorry, I was a dick. You know, oh, wow. I think there's a little bit of like I just need to throw a rock at somebody to make myself feel better. And then if you go to their profile, you see that they do it to a lot of people. Huh. And it's just some kind of addiction and or adrenaline addiction or some kind of needing to be seen or pulling on people's pigtails or I only made that one comment about those culottes and that detachable <laughs> collar. And that's the only time I've ever commented on anything on the internet. Only time. I love you so much. What an honor. Thank you for being here. Gosh, thank you so much for having me in your beautiful, beautiful home. Oh, gosh, what a dream. You're a dream. Such a fan. I'm going to try to not embarrass Good place myself. to have a dream in a dream house. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> 
goodness. I have to pee. I have to pee so, so bad. bad. Me too. <laughs>